One of the lessons we learn in life is that we should not invest in things, but in experiences, knowledge, and relationships. I've been thinking about one particular kind of relationship recently: friendship. What is a friendship? What makes people friends? I was sitting the other day with a friend of mine who comes over about once a year, and he said that to him, friendship meant that you could sit with someone for a long time, and neither of you felt the need to say anything. You were both in that time comfortable in your own skins and comfortable in that shared space. Another quality of friendship that I value is that you can be yourself with a friend. There are no filters, and this should apply for both people. I realized that with some friends, we could just say what we wanted to each other. the no offense taken no hidden narratives but with others i had the sense that they held back that they weighed their words and actions that they thought things about you that they wouldn't actually say to you and sometimes they wouldn't even assume goodwill which is a cardinal rule of every conversation or relationship with me that you assume the other person means well unless you have concrete reason not to i decided to try to be less and less with this kind of person it takes away too much mental energy to be so calculating about friendships to be getting meta about what another person may be thinking friendships are also different depending on gender men carry this burden of masculinity you're not supposed to express your emotions and sometimes that may even stop you from expressing your feelings to yourself another question that strikes me about friendship is how it forms back in the days before the internet you were restricted by geography to communities of circumstance today we can form communities of choice but can a friendship be virtual can you feel close to a person you've never met and you may not even know what they look like i've had reason to think about that as well i don't have answers to all these questions but i do know that i should not take friendships for granted as perhaps i used to once the material things in our life they are cold and only there to serve a purpose the people we surround ourselves with they make all this worthwhile welcome to the seen and the unseen Our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is my old and dear friend Chandrahas Chaudhary. We met as colleagues in the early 2000s at Crick and Four. We were both early bloggers. He went on to a flourishing career as a literary critic and book reviewer. He wrote three novels, edited different anthologies, and wrote a charming book of literary and personal essays called My Country Is Literature. I'll link all of these from the show notes. We used to hang out a lot together in the Otis, but I've come to like and respect him more and more as the years have gone by. With Hash, as his friends call him. What you see is what you get. There is not a shred of artifice to him. He is always true to himself and to the moment he is in. He also engages deeply with the world, whether he is writing or cooking or reading. And maybe this begins by his engaging deeply with literature. He is one of the best readers I know. I feel I have a lot to learn from Hash about reading and writing and literature, but the conversation you will now hear, I mean, <laughs> I hope you'll hear it, covers a lot of other ground as well. It gave me a lot to think about and I hope you enjoy it as well. Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've taught 20 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing. An online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, a lovely and lively community at the end of it. The course costs rupees 10,000 per. GST or about one fifty dollars, and is a monthly thing. So if you're interested, head on over to register at IndiaUncut.com/clearwriting. That's IndiaUncut.com/clearwriting. Being a good writer doesn't require God-given talent; just the willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills. I can help you. Chandra Haas, welcome to the Seen and the Unseen. So happy to be here. so i was uh, reading your excellent introductory essay in your book my country's literature and uh, a lot of memories also came back because you you've sort of written in that about um, your uh, young years in bombay as a young writer and working and we were colleagues at that time and those were sort of early years for me as well yeah. right and we are both kind yeah. of finding our feet and maybe in a sense uh, finding ourselves as uh, Absolutely. sort of uh, people and when we met outside it told me some, something very interesting like like you mentioned how You met a mutual friend of ours from Cricket Four, Rahul Bhattacharya, recently in Calcutta. So shout out to him. I 
thought of you back then when we you were both in cricket for us young whipper snappers <laughs> and it's difficult for me to make the inter- mental adjustment where i now th- now you're middle aged man <laughs> yeah, kind of like my we <laughs> are yeah. like myself and uh, and you said something interesting you said that however you know you you'll always think of me as you know, someone in his early 30s because that's when you first met me and Late i will 20s, of course always yes. think of you as a young whipper snapper <laughs> and, uh, and and to meet old friends is therefore to be transported back to a different time and place and uh, so on and so forth so for someone who is more social than me and presumably has more uh, friends than me tell me a little bit about um, you know your view of friendships because i had a guest uh, on the show uh, abhinandan sekri who said something very interesting he said after the age of 25 he's not made any friends everyone he knows is from before that mm-hmm. i find with with me it's almost the other way yeah. around and partly because of course the uh, internet and that everything that happened exposed me to a, a whole bunch of new people but also because um, i changed a lot and therefore anyone who would have been in my friend at uh, uh, 20 though god knows why that would have been the case for them you know i'm a totally different person so what what what's your view of this well i think it's a, a great question to start off on because uh, i'm a late arrival on your show what is it episode uh, 200 something but uh, i'm not sure a lot of your guests have the same history that you and i have isn't it yeah, absolutely. and yeah. that is something to remember and celebrate because uh, as i recall we met for the first time although i'd read you before and perhaps you might have just heard of me new arrival in the office we met in the last week of june 2003 only about a 5 minute auto ride from where we're sitting right now in your studio so in a sense it's a full circle for us today after nearly 20 years and uh, i was 23 and so excited to be have my first job and i think you had been around a while and uh, had this kind of like star appeal for the younger writers because you were i think you you were t- there's six years between us you were 29 and just as you're sitting across this table now perhaps there was double the distance between us but for some reason fate and there is such a thing as fate i do believe now at least like life seems to have taught me so fate had put us in one line and uh, as i recall at the time you know uh, it was uh, it's a shock for anybody any young person out of university to start to go to work and realize that whatever that that glamour that uh, attaches itself to that world from outside you know collapses very very swiftly especially when you find out uh, how having an afternoon nap is frowned on but uh, i think we used to uh, uh, my default gesture in at work the two years i was there was to turn right wow and as you used to uh, keep saying to auto drivers when you used to go leftward ho jaiye leftist ho jaiye <laughs> 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 so you turn right to me. <laughs> yeah. You turn left, and we would discuss some New Yorker piece or some essay. Uh, my passions, your passions, which have always been quite dif- different, but uh, we have enjoyed sharing them and sometimes facing off, you know, with our positions and enjoying that 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 that, that, that disputatiousness. And uh, actually, uh, yeah, this is also the time. Speaking of friendship, uh, maybe I'll uh, say a few things about friendship in general before segueing back, uh, which is that. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, to finish my point here, is there anything so consoling and fulfilling and sweet in life as old friendships re- rekindled? Or uh, you know, you don't have to say anything. I find lots of times when I see my friends now, after the first thrill of chat for hours and hours, you lapse into a kind of uh, companionable silence. You don't need to say a lot to each other. You just, but it's enjoyable to inhabit the same space and you know, just say a word or two or look at each other, things like that. And my dream is, you know, every, everybody has a dream. I, I, I would love. to at some point in my life live in a street where ev- all my friends lived in houses down down the street <laughs> uh, although i know you know you, your friends as you must also know the friends your friends are necessarily not friends of each other and uh, they can cause conflict by sometimes you know so that way life always gives you one extra problem to solve every time you solve something but uh, i think in my life as it turned out friendship has a very very big place and uh, in the end i think it is the defining category of human communication love is a very big thing friendship is also a kind of love but uh, since in our culture the word love has sort of been uh, leans a bit towards either romantic love or the love for parents and for family in the end i think friendship is a more egalitarian and democratic ideal where you can be friends with anybody at half an hour you know uh, some of the deepest chats of my life have been people i've never seen more than once 
And uh, in that sense, I think it's so liberating to realize that you don't, friendship need not be a function of time. It just needs to be a function of energy and attitude and uh, uh, ser- the wonderful serendipity of life, which I think as 20th century people, you know, born in the 60s and 70s, we've had the great fortune to enjoy an, an ease of range and reach that uh, perhaps our fathers or mothers perhaps having the same instincts would never would have had to live in much smaller social spheres so i think in that sense bombay is very important to me as the, the very difficult learning ground of friendship because in my 20s just like you i was perhaps a bit more much more introverted and i really struggled to make relationships other than the ones i relied on and reflexively when you wanted to see somebody you'd go back to someone you already knew you never looked to but uh, i thought i'd finish by reading <laughs> A small passage from my new book, My Country's Literature, which actually has to do with you. And uh, in a way, it's also about what I owe you because, you know, like every young person, uh, I, f- I firmly believe that, you know, every uh, whether, uh, every young person, whether man or woman, needs somebody a, a touch older to hold your hand a bit of the way because you really don't know. There's the thing about being young. You don't know what lies ahead of you. And uh, I always remember it was very generous of you suddenly to give away one of your two very famous blogs at the time. You had the you had India Uncut in the middle stage and you were away, I think, uh, doing the cyclone perhaps in the tsunami in Chennai. Tsunami, and you said, yeah. why don't you just post a few things while I'm gone? And I really obviously took to it because every young writer thirsts for an audience and not having an audience and suddenly finding I had one, which is your audience. Uh, I suddenly realized what a great pleasure it was. And you could have always said, you know, now you start off on your own, but you gave me your, your house, so to speak, virtually. And uh, this is my memory in my book, uh, this is a little memoir. So there's one paragraph about, about this. The sudden mushrooming of a literary subculture in the early years of the 2000s, a subculture of personal web blogs, also provided an escape from constrictions of the formal book review and the mainstream media. I entered this realm under the benign supervision of one of the great influences of my life in my 20s, the Mumbai writer Amit Varma, first encountered during my two year stint in the offices of Crick Info, where his desk was exactly across the aisle from mine. All day long, we exchanged snippets of conversation about cricket, American journalism, novels, Bombay, and the meaning of freedom, both in the standard and this was a Verma pet cause in the libertarian sense of the word. While after 5 p.m., when restrictions were lifted, we tussled with bat and rubber ball in ferocious test matches down the very same corridor, thereby spending our day across the two axes of a sort of cross. My literary weblog, The Middle Stage, is actually a space that he had set up, created a readership for, and then generously conceded once I'd written a few guest posts for it. So I think this is the chance to say on your show, thank you. I mean, I know that many people can thank you for all sorts of things. No one can thank you for this. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, uh, when I first read that, I have to confess I almost teared up because I would not have imagined I would be, that anyone would describe me as an influence. I think you're being a... No, no, so many would. You are being a little too self-deprecating. No, here. I mean, I th- you should own your influence. Happily. I think back on myself at that time and I wonder how can those who are lost lead others? <laughs> That's <laughs> sort of what it uh, feels like. But the, the, the cricket was, of course, great fun. Mm. And uh, we used to play with this little ball, which was halfway between plastic and a squeezy ball. <laughs> and I had mastered this particular um, uh, sort of imparting forward and backward spin on it. Uh, and that forward spin would uh, r- rush across at great pace. You are the only spin spin swing baller in the history of cricket. In the history of cricket and Rahul Dravid came once to our <laughs> office. I bowled three balls to him. The first one was a wide, the next two he was bowled and then he said, ki, then he called me Shoaib and refused to play anymore. And I, w- and I was thinking, Shoaib chucks, I'm not even straight, <laughs> you know. I'm not chucking, it's my fingers. It's, it's, <laughs> no, no, but you you were, of course, a far better player than me. And you've actually played at a decent level. You played for Trinity College, right? Yeah, it wasn't a decent level. It was a, it was a decent environment, rather. There's nothing more pleasurable, uh, although I haven't played for many years, than, you know, cricket, English summer afternoon with the blue sky and white clouds above and the green grass below. And especially, I mean, this is what I realized, it's strange. What, uh, the sound that a new ball makes in the air as you bowl it, not too fast, clearly, in my case, but you can even listen to it going down. But it makes a little sound um, like a cricket. And then, you know, either it goes past the bat or, or it makes a much bigger sound as it gets sent off somewhere into the wilds. But um, yeah, it was such a big part of my life that I think in the end, like with so many things, when I renounced it, I did it completely. I left no doors open for it to s- sneak in anywhere. In your footnotes to this, where you mentioned me here, you uh, said that uh, you you have described your time with me and other mutual friends like Sonia and Rahul and all that in uh, uh, an essay called The Drinking Companions of My Youth, which I googled for frantically <laughs> and did not find it. And you have now told me it was made up. But while googling for it, 
I actually came across a, a piece where you and I share a byline, which we wrote together. Apparently, really? on 26 October 2003 for Cricket Info, and it is a bizarre piece to co-write with someone because it's like really short, and it's the the, the title of the piece is Two Men Who Left Herdman Alone." Yes, I think it's a bit of stats analysis we yeah. did together. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. That's right. Yeah, and it was very weird. I'm looking at it and I can't figure out which part could be yours, which part could be mine. How we did this, I have zero memory of it, uh, and the writing is a little callow. So it's probably me. <laughs> <because> <laughs> I was even callower than you. Let us not compete for callowness now. Yeah, in our youth, let us not <laughs> compete for. Callowness. No, the other, uh, the the interesting thing about your essay is one thing that I found is whenever I've had old friends on the show yeah. who I've known before and really from blogging times, uh, I find that I discover little aspects of them that yeah. I had never known. So mm. you know, I could be friends with someone for fifteen, sixteen years and never understood this. And this this essay, for example, gave me. uh not just obviously more knowledge about all the things you did in the years when we you know weren't colleagues or whatever but even gave me context for those years because sure you worked with me in cricket for but i i i I'm, you know i had no context of where it is in your life or the journey that you're on yes. or what's happening and all of that so in the spirit of finding out uh, more about old friends i'll ask you to kind of Take me back all the way. Take me back to your childhood. Like, where were you born? What mm-hmm. was your childhood like? Tell me a bit about that. Hmm. Well, um, I mean, I'm trying to think of what is interesting about my biography. That is a better uh, and rather than just. I, go I think you it. could suffer the curse of knowledge here, and you could think that things which feel banal and commonplace to you could be interesting to others. Hmm. So yes. Well, uh, uh, let's put it this way. I think the most, the as I look back on my life now at nearly forty two, I think the most durable influences of my first twelve or thirteen years, I think, were. Uh, my parents parents marriage and the circumstances in which they married obviously i didn't know until i was a bit older but uh, i remember a day when uh, we moved to orissa i grew up in several small towns around india and uh, my parents used to work in lic i remember one day they got posted back to orissa which is where my parents are from and uh, one day my mother said come let's go somewhere and we got into a cycle rickshaw and we went somewhere and stopped outside her house and uh, she rang the bell and two old people came toodling out you know like those dolls in a play and i looked little questioning at my mother who are these and she said this is my mommy and daddy and the very fact that i it had never occurred to me that your parents are parents <laughs> uh, showed what a gap there was in the in, uh, very unusual in the india of the time between my parents and my uh, and the people above them so i think my mother and father met at training school in lic and uh, decided to get married very much against my mother's parents wishes because uh, she was a higher caste than my father was looking back now i never asked him about it because he passed away when i was 22 but uh, this must have been very upsetting for my father as a man who grew up in a village and really made his way up in the world and was the first person in his family to go to university i think to be rejected without even being interviewed so to speak for the role <laughs> so uh, they always had a very fractious relationship and they really could never sort out the issues you know it was very uh, and looking back now you know as at our confusions in our 20s you think when you get married at that age and you have lost that layer above you people to help you with your troubles how can you make it the chances are very very low so that was the environment at home as a result of which perhaps i was became very bookish in that that was my one source of consolation growing up and my father was tremendously i've written about him in my book for the first time i think in detail he was a tremendously dynamic and inspiring figure who suddenly transplanted his dreams onto me my son will be a writer i don't think i can but you know i can groom this person so i had books on tap which was wonderful for a middle class family at that time and my father was very proud of me and he actually used to say to me you should write every day And when I started doing it, then you would say, "Now you can't let up." Now you've. I was almost like you know that uh, um, what is called a pathway dependency in economics. I know <laughs> you like economic concepts, so I'm prepared two or three to throw oh, in. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I'm utterly terrified. I hope I understand what you mean when you use them. <laughs> But by tw- by age twelve, I was in a pathway dependent state. You know, have, having done all sort of the groundwork to become a writer under my father's careful supervision. But I think spiritually and in a way romantically, I think uh, the greatest love affair of my life. life began on june 28 1989 when we arrived in bombay for the first time my fam- parents had gotten transferred here we moved to a small apartment in burivli and uh, i think to live in uh, as i I'd, i've forgotten now exactly when you arrived in bombay it was sometime during the 90s i'm sure 
uh, I think to live in Bombay during the 90s was to have an amazing kind of education in a certain kind of Indianness and a certain kind of life and a certain kind of ur- urbanism and a certain kind of uh, multiculturalism. And all those things are subconsciously, although it was a very fractious decade in Bombay, a like very dark decade, and perhaps you might say we have not, never completely gone past 1992 and the riots of 92 in some ways. We have become a more ghettoized city. Even so, for a young person, it was a tremendous education for whatever my parents could manage. And uh, from then on, I've always had a special feeling for Bombay because although I love Delhi as well, I've written a city essay about both cities. When a, when a city has claim over your childhood, no city of an adulthood can match it because uh, those feelings go past your ability to rationally anal- analyze them at the time. So they have a special charge and beauty that you will never get from, you know, from the time you're adult. And in that way, even now I find I've been in Bombay the last week, all I want to do, I, I make plans to meet friends, but all I really want to do is take buses and trains randomly and look at buildings and uh, pull up my memories in a, uh, uh, you know, through chance. So that I think is my childhood. And then uh, I think I went to Xavier's, like with, uh, perhaps you also. I you know, know, Xavier's, okay, right. my yes, yes, yes. I went to Xavier's for a bit where I, um, perhaps the, there was no distinction about that, except that I perhaps met the first, the first really good writer of my uh, life. One on one, not with my father's intervention, uh, because my father did, did intervene and he was very happy to come to Bombay because it felt like now there's access to all these Bombay writers. I've written about a few of them in the book. But I met Eunice D'Souza, who was a very interesting and intriguing presence at the time. She was like no teacher I'd met before. First of all, she was hugely sarcastic and always looked bored with you. You know, you so you almost had to work to impress her. And uh, I didn't spend a lot of time under supervision, but I could see that there was something very interesting about her. And what was interesting about her seemed to come from literature. And this was an interesting insight that, you know, you read books. I don't think I knew a lot of other literary people then. That you read books to sort of also grow a certain secret kind of self that can't is not easily readable with, by the world. And I think this is a, I, I almost feel it's a good model for a teacher to follow. Do not give yourself away completely. Keep something in reserve to, not out of a deliberate strategy, but just because, you know, it should be hard work to realize all the things that are there, the doorways that can open. You can't, it can't be an open, uh, you cannot be an open book, so to speak. The passages you wrote about your father in in that essay are, of course, very, you know, move me a lot. Mm. And in some ways, they reminded me of my own dad who, mm. who died last year, who had a perhaps a more privileged path that, than uh, your dad did. You speak about how, you know, your dad wanted you to rise. You write, I'll just quote that bit where uh, you say about your father, quote, he wanted me to rise above our middle class life in the same proportion as he had um, uh, risen into it. Stop quote, you you know, you talk about how he gets your books, uh, his great generosity with books and how he would go, f- you know, try to promote your early writing, go and meet different writers, ask them for advice and all of that. I was also struck by this interesting sentence where you wrote, quote, your father will always love you, but you must also earn his respect. Stop quote. Mm. And when you kind of shape yourself and you, sh- you, you, you think about the things that you want in life, yes. how much were they kind of shaped by that, shaped by that direction that your father was uh, pushing you towards and the dream that he uh, mm. uh, saw for you. Mm. And is that something, is that a thought that you go back to? Yes. You know, uh, uh, actually that line, your father will always love you, but you must earn his respect. I mean, did you find yourself thinking when you read it, is it something that I was uh, interpreting his attitude or was it something he said? It's not clear. Who says it? No, in the in, in the sense that uh, you say it. that's that's what I thought in the passage that uh, yes, but you know this uh, actually uh, writing novels uh, gives you a, a certain ability to uh, use indirect speech to actually you were using free indirect here. Yes, it's actually something my father said to me. You know, and so oh. at the time it was something that made me think a lot. And what does mm. this actually mean? You know, you're too. Uh, naive to work out but what does it mean that like uh, respect and so is, is this something different from does it mean there's two levels of relationship I can achieve both only one uh, yes and uh, you know one never loses one's parents inheritance as, as Indians <laughs> who should know this better than us Indians but uh, uh, that inheritance, uh, I think that's why I wanted to write about him here because his inheritance is very complicated and I spent my entire life unpicking the good bits from the bad ones. It was by no means uh, uniformly benign or generous or, you know, uh, there was always also an element of competition in it and of pressure, of control. 
as it is with many parents uh, and uh, sadly he didn't live long enough for us to be able to have a conversation about it so you know these are mental conversations you have and actually i feel um, you know the older you grow and especially if you work in art you realize that dead are never really dead in so many ways i mean even this line can be interpreted in 100 different ways but you can actually make your peace with somebody even afterwards when it's a bit too late and uh, in that sense i think um, in the last few years i found myself having very interesting conversations with my father in a sort of imaginative space where i don't feel there is that trauma or that the difficulty anymore and uh, in that way i think uh, he was a tra- what i really credit him for is being a tremendously interesting and dynamic man in a way that i actually find myself in a bizarre way resembling him more and more and it's so strange that you do it so long your father wants you to be like him but <laughs> you're not going to let him have that gift easily and in that way you know i think uh, it actually leads me to uh, the issue of whether uh, masculinity is the same kind of burden or training or in- inheritance to bear as femininity is do women go through the same kinds of learning and conflicts with their mothers as men do with their fathers i would perhaps say we need not equalize it to this extent there could be very specific kinds of things that you only go through that is true for one gender it did leave me with the problem though i think both of having a very pressuring man in charge of me all of my childhood and then him suddenly disappearing when i became an adult and leaving me completely lost about how to deal with all those things that you are then ready for which would never be at the age of 12 or 13 and uh, of course one never knows this at the time you can only look back and find these things out that's the whole thing about life that you know many of its truths appear only when the train has long left the station and uh, so then what is one supposed to do one cannot make up for lost time but uh, you can build on it relive it take something away from it that you had lost sight of and uh, give something back perhaps seeing other people in the same place and realizing that now you have the key to open the uh, the doors of their uh, their difficulties and then you should not stop i think one should perhaps even risk it even one one should risk being re- rejected by the other person saying you are coming on too strongly perhaps to say you know let us you know this is something that i can help you with i find so in that way the masculinity is also you know a tradition and uh, i feel perhaps we uh, i mean in the same way meeting you today i feel you know there's so much to talk about because now that we are older uh, there's so many more barriers that have disappeared between us than that we don't need to uh, i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong but you know i left cricket for after 2 years but we stayed in touch a lot we used to meet almost every week there was also perhaps you know in a very good way there was something competitive between us your essay this week your blog post this week what readers used to comment on mine as soon as we used to upset each other sometimes with the attitudes and uh, i'm sure both of us suddenly th- at thought a hundreds of times the truth is so clear why doesn't you get the whole point of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but there are many truths and there are some truths which you can see depending on where you come from so in that sense i think uh, this is the good thing about sort of entering at the second half of life or becoming a bit older uh, some things become much easier maybe not physically but mentally and spiritually and one should take up those those things mm. yeah i mean when we were having breakfast you asked me you know in what ways had i changed because yes. i mentioned that i'm such a different person and one way certainly is that i i was much more competitive and i won't even say competitive maybe that sense of competitiveness came from a little bit of insecurity as well mm. and it also came from perhaps want wanting to be seen and not actually wanting to be you want to be seen as something mm. that you aspire to be but you're not that yet if that kind of makes any sense mm. it's and true for so many young people and it's, it's true it's for all young people it's a perfectly natural thing to be at that age it's, i think it's it's true for all <laughs> young people i guess and we'll come back to masculinity later because yes. i want to explore a lot there but before that another sort of thought which is that you know in my dad's last year mm. i saw him become a very different person from what he had been mm. and you m- mentioned i think in a couple of sentences about how your dad also towards the end he yes. was more frail and he had changed a little bit yes and i think about those changes in my dad and i think that those changes in my dad didn't even come because of self reflection as they might come some t- uh, as they might come sometimes but partly because of physiology in the sense that his memory mm. faded through his life yes. so at the end all he remembered were the edges the childhood mm. and yes. uh, right the end and everything was a blur once he asked me that you know to s- describe my growing up years to him because he didn't remember me as a child <laughs> which is kind of mm. poignant and and then when you uh, spoke about how sort of still remember your father and have conversations with him and i thought that even the memories that we have yes. are really stories we are telling ourselves 
we are taking little bits and pieces of what they were and what we remember and that's what we are constructing them as without the baggage of everything else that we might want to forget and there is a lot of that too yes so to what extent do you think this is true because at one level it's easy to do when you think of those who are not with us because they are gone and you can shape them in any way you want and in another way they are sort of still with us and therefore when we are with them they are not just a person they are now mm-hmm. in our interactions they are also everything that they have been all this time yes you say our memories of people who are gone are collages of moments that we take which perhaps not necessarily that significant or things in or the even impressions and of course yes. they are significant to us so in that sense mm. they are as real as anything yes well uh, first of all how could it be any other way you know so in a sense it's not uh, i mean uh, for instance recently i found a new project when i go back to orissa i try to meet people who knew my father when he was in his 20s Wow. So they can give me something about him that I would never have known even because I wasn't even born then. And uh, they also tremendously, you know, uh, obviously um, they are so full of details which you could never <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, my father was briefly a, a lecturer in a college and uh, uh, you know there was always something very um, idiosyncratic about him and i remember my uncle uh, my mother's bro- younger brother was briefly a student at that college and he said i don't remember anything of your father except that he used to come to class and read film magazines uh, this is such a great <laughs> Imagine the audacity as a recently appointed lecturer to come and be reading film fair in class telling the students you know he's only a bit older than them so but in that sense you know I'm I'm actually enjoying the task of finding out you know there's so many things that you will come to know for instance I, we never had a chat about politics the 90s were a very fraught decade politically i can't really say although i'm thinking a lot whether you'd be a congress voter or bjp voter today or or or, or in 2002 or 4 i cannot reclaim or even uh, imagine persuasively some of his choices and ideas but uh, you know it's just a metaphor for finding things out about life as well you know the the past is always much murkier and much more complicated than the stories your parents have told you uh um and uh they've left you with this bag and you've got to go around filling it up <laughs> with pebbles on this on the on the sh- on, the, on the shore or oh, you empty the bag uh and no <laughs> <laughs> speaking of the past um you know so i i i was cleaning up um, my dad's things gave away most of his books just kept a few gave away most of them and uh, but i kept some old diaries that i found of his yes. and there's one of those diaries which is really interesting because it indicates that at some point in his life i don't know when he wanted to write as well yes and uh, there are ideas for stories in there and all of that and they are very hesitant they also kind of callow so i'm assuming that he must have written them when he was in his 20s or when he was young and before kind of life got in the way and and it's interesting but you know speaking of red bag of pebbles i think maybe sometimes you just give it away and kind of uh, <laughs> uh, get get on with it i I'm, i'm struck by something i read just yesterday i think which 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 is almost banal but it came across as interesting where this guy i think tweeted and i'm really sorry but i've forgotten who but if i find it i'll put it in the show notes where uh, uh, and I may not even have been on twitter may have been some, somewhere else but this guy was writing about how a friend of his uh, asked him that how often are you going to meet the meet your parents in the rest of your life and he said what kind of question is that and he said how often do you go home and he said i go home once a year so the guy said oh then they are in the 60s right so on average you'll meet them whatever 15 16 times for the rest of your life which kind of stunned him so much that yes. he moved to uh, live closer <laughs> to them Yes which is an interesting thought because all of us live under this sort of illusion that we will live forever and actually the things mm. that are dear to us we perhaps understand their dearness only after it's gone and not just in the context of parents but mm. any other thing any as well other, anything else yes that is true we tend to take for granted what we have um yes but but uh, but also as we well know also being too close to one's parents is uh, also has pr- problems of its own uh in that sense i think i have a good relationship with my mother you know we like the story you said we probably see each other more than once a year for sure and for quite long periods of time but we have another project of own which is that she's my translator in oriya now yeah, yeah and she's yeah. actually doing a tremendous job and she's actually a full fledged writer in her own right and i love reading what she's done with my work and sometimes i tell her that you are better than me this is <laughs> <laughs> yeah fascinating so let's go back to your early years mm. in uh, after you shifted to bombay yes o- o- across two levels one is what is the stuff that you're reading what is sort of your reading life shaping up to be because you mentioned in your essay that you were a 
quote voracious unsystematic indiscriminating yes. reader yes. uh and that that's one thing that's happening and and just to focus on that like i i i remember that you know initially you just when i was a kid and i was reading mm. I, you just read everything right everything is a story book yes and my sense that there was something more that there was something called literature something mm. that was worth spending one's time on came at the age of 10 when uh, i picked up this nice hardback edition of the house of the dead hmm. uh, by dostoevsky about his time in siberia because the uh, title sounded funky right house yeah. of the dead it'll be something interesting and then of course uh, got completely s- switched on to dostoevsky read everything by him and all of that and that sort of an what at the age of 10 at the age of 10 this is really bit precocious early, bit too early i also read all of shakespeare at the age of 10 though and now realize it that <laughs> I I now realize that I was not reading it as literature literature it was affecting me in a different way but obviously I didn't have any of the tools or the life experience to be able to make as much out of it as I would uh, you know uh, when I reread it as an adult but w- what was that sort of journey for you into books and a understanding what lit- literature could do and b wanting at some point to write yourself mm-hmm. well i'm i'm afraid i cannot report anything of the order of dostoevsky or shakespeare <laughs> 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 it was books for children perhaps a touch above my age you know when you're 10 you read the books for 13 when you're 13 you read the books for 15 or whatever and then uh, at some point you know you get uh, totally caught up with whatever you get on the pavement book stalls sewer fountain for which reason i retain this romantic attachment for walking down those 200 250 title uh, tiles um uh, of land and uh, yes i think it was very voracious very unsystematic but it was thought and this bit i've kept throughout my life that you know life is not worth anything if you're not reading constantly uh, which is something that many middle class parents taught you but i think my father really uh, i think my father was the only person who if i said to him can i miss school today dad if i write a poem by the evening uh, and sit at home he'd say okay that's a trade no problem wow. see you see you in the evening and he head off to work my mother would be tremendously upset of course you know denying the boy education etc but uh, that sense of unorthodoxy was what uh, appealed to me about literature that you know it's not a formal system everybody studied and worked hard and whatever but literature is not a system where the input and outputs can be matched in this way it's much more uh provisional improvised uh, unsystematic uh, hopeful uh soulful and uh, it makes you a bit of a dreamer and sometimes it makes you too bookish and not set up for dealing with the problems of life because you kind of retreat at any for instance i think for a lot of my life i retreated from conflicts because i just thought i can read a book and sort this out you know <laughs> let me not actually fight with the person involved and uh, but it was i think a tremendous education and uh, between that Bombay and my family situation where which meant that we have a very high wall between home and the world it was not just a door and a house it was much higher than that there was an invisible wall that meant people didn't come to see us we really went to see people um inside the house there's always conflict and uh, different kinds of wars so i think the only real source of uh, reliable uh inspiration and pleasure was one my relationship with my dad and two books and and playing cricket in the evenings um all evening long so you know it's not a bad childhood to have at all and bombay on top of that so um, that's my memory and you know it's um it can uh, bombay has changed a lot in the early 90s you know when india was just liberalizing and i remember the day i mean i don't know if you were around when mcdonald's first started in india I, I on linking road very much the a, queue was uh, 4 or 500 people long yeah. and uh, i even remember the day i drank my first coke in uh, in a, thun- a thunderstorm uh, opposite mitibai college in a small uh, wow. shop there so you know th- these things never leave you and um, bombay is a great great training school to become to become a writer i that can't think there's any better place in the world i mean i'm sure there must be you mean that in terms of stories that surround you yes the intensity of stories the depth of people's feelings and passions and the amount of things you have to hide or suppress or repress so that you can just get by in the day for space love time all these things and uh, the different histories uh, and you know being a colonial city and having a certain kind of architecture the sea you know uh, why why is uh, the the favorite metaphor for the unconscious the sea <laughs> no we actually have a sea forget <laughs> having the sea of the unconscious when you put it all together it's uh, a fantastic 
you know uh, you don't need to send writers to university just get them to stay in bombay for 5 years at some age and they'll work it out by themselves yeah i, I you know i think to, to use that uh, sort of fashionable word these days people who live in bombay have normalized it <laughs> and so that you know i guess if you don't want to write that great opportunity is uh, yes. uh, kind of something you won't even notice and, mm. and even the sea like i i i've lived there more than 20 25 years i've probably been to the sea a handful of times so really? uh-huh. yeah i've been to the sea much more when i go on vacation but <laughs> chalo beach jaate hai but uh-huh. you know here yes. we are kind of uh, right by the sea by the way when we were looking for flats to rent last year before mm. we took the place where we are right now we saw this uh, beautiful flat along that versova road huge flat and for a more affordable price than this uh, and the windows were right over the sea right over the sea you mm. could just stand there and there's just sea outside there's nothing else it was beautiful and eventually we didn't take it because uh, sadly the other sea that i need in my life is uh, reliable broadband <laughs> and that was in this old building where the building society had made a deal with one particular broadband oh, supplier oh, and that mm, never ends well what a tragedy so a, a bit a tragedy for the building <laughs> but uh, so uh, there's a nice passage here where you talk about your time in college in bombay yeah. and you say quote it was only at university that the relationship between literature and literary study the deep past of literature and the way it flowed into the present became clear to me and the world of literary criticism and its possibilities opened up here was a new stage in the reading life requiring the disenchantment in a technical sense of the naive reader stop quote and by the naive reader you're of course referring to what pamuk's pamuk's formulation of someone who just kind of read everything from herman hess to james jadley chase chase as you describe yourself so tell me a bit about sort of this um, you know awakening is a dramatic word but this sort of shift where you begin to take books this seriously yes you know uh, a ba in english is a very complicated kind of uh, education to have for many indian writers actually one could devote an entire anthology to the legacies of having such a degree i, I have one by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there you go so, we have that in common too and you common. would also know this thing you know in some way you become very literary but also a little too english english in your english if you know what i mean and uh, you feel you have these ideas and concepts and your models are in invariably if you're studying english literature in the old sense which is mainly british and these days american writers then those are your models i mean uh transplanting dickens to bombay etc etc there's a way in which can be done but in the end you're routing your sensibility through another culture and then all the way back again you can't make that sort of journey and expect things to be very simple plus uh, you know many people i know uh, decide to study english because they love reading but they find out on taking the degree that this is precisely what has become so complicated reading is very complicated you have to analyze everything uh, as you do so the pleasure begins to uh, leach out of the system and uh, i'll grant you this much there's nothing like some kinds of literary critics to make sure that the pleasure disappears because you know uh, this is the crisis of english studies and one it has never completely gotten out itself out of when you try to make it a formal discipline and especially to mimic the sciences and to make make it look like there's a certain language of literary criticism and a certain method in the end um, literature does not allow for you know applying the same test over and over again also the critic is in sort of com- always in a kind of competition with the writer to determine whose whose sense of the meaning of the work is stronger or better and uh, that's not a victory you can win because uh, when you do not know the ways in which creativity works it's very hard to analyze it on the reception side uh you know I, in that way i think i'm a better literary critic because i also write novels and know sometimes what a writer is trying to do in a certain passage or sentence or word or chapter or structure but uh, i mean all these things are in like the sea of li- of literary criticism and again you have to find a boat that somehow you know navigates those waters and you sail in it and remain happy and that was another journey that took me a long long time to work out it i cannot write academic literary criticism but there's some things in there that actually makes sense you know the idea of the narrator for instance i think is very valuable you know we in usually when we many people read a novel they say there the characters and then the characters are saying something and the writer's point of view above them is that it's not necessarily always the writer's point of view the writer makes up a point of view for the book so it's not exactly the writer it's a unnamed figure whose voice is controlling the writing in the book i e so when you give that a formal name the narrator it clarifies many things about how power relations in novels work you know who takes charge of whose voice who organizes the material it's very very valuable and to me you know like it's 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 very helpful in working out how to write novels but uh, i found myself then thinking i i i cannot stay on in literary study i have to use this in some way to become a writer 
and that's going to take another few years so in the meantime what do i do and that's when i came back to bombay and that's when we met i realized i cannot stay on in the, in the university because that is going to take me in another completely an, a, on in, in in a different direction and uh, i want to live in the space between writing about books and writing books and uh, that's how it turned up and <laughs> mm you know the point that you mentioned about the joy of the book going uh, yes away. you have a lovely passage about uh, that as well where you write quote i could go only so far in aligning myself with the values of those newly prominent readers brackets my critics who broke down a text almost like a doctor studying a blood sample or interrogating it in the light of one or other kind of literary theory often it seemed to me they took an object of delight and clothed it from top to toe in interpretation soporific drone to be sure there were those critics who added a glow to a pathway into the writer's work but more often than not they wrestled it down as if dealing with an excitable dog as if literature for them was only a, st- a stop on the road and the purpose of literary criticism explicitly to disarm enchantment and i want to ask a sort of a broader question here which is about literature as it is studied and taught within academia yes. and literature itself like i remember when i was in uh, college uh, a good uh, friend of mine um uh, uh, decided that he would go abroad and he got admission to uh, to study and he got admission into a place teaching film studies and he was very passionate about cinema so i said great you're going abroad to study film studies this means you're going to be a filmmaker next and he laughed and said no 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 i'm never going to make anything and i kind of wondered then what's the point <laughs> then you know what are you even doing and similarly the impression uh, many people have about literature as it is taught in academia and elsewhere a lot of it seeps into criticism as well mm. is that there is you know a writer writes a novel or whatever uh, whatever she writes with a, a totally different intent and purpose in mind mm. a- and and to kind of look at it like you would look at a blood sample and to tr- you know uh, look at it through the prism of this literary theory or that literary theory maybe evaluate it on the basis of whether its politics uh, is or is mm. not desirable mm. uh, you know i i think that can kind of become a trap and this is true i think in some extent of academics of yes. many yeah. other fields also given that you know literary criticism is really and you you know spoke about different categories of it which we'll go into but you know it, it is something that is taking from both these seas one is a sea of academia which is disconnected from the real world and i mean it entirely in a pejorative sense yes and and the other is a sea of life itself from which uh, the work itself comes yes so was this something that you thought about what do you think about it now was it complicated for you yes i think about it all the time even today uh, but i think my it was most productive in my 20s when i was actually trying to work out the system based on these conflicts uh, perhaps a few notes on what you said i think the comparison between film studies and filmmaking that your your friend stumbled upon whether they did or didn't is not an exact analogy to literary criticism and writing because uh, in filmmaking you study the art of making cinema in film studies you're still using language to analyze cinema literary criticism is the only kind of criticism where you use the same medium as what you are analyzing language so it is closer to the literary work than film a film review would be to a film uh and uh, also you know a ba in english or english study is a fairly new development in the west from which we've got it in india you know 100 120 years before that all literary critics were in a sense amateurs they wrote for the same pleasure of reading that you and i would have had and so there's an, actually an easy way past the last 100 years into aristotle or anybody you know there's amazing anthologies available now ancient chinese literary criticism indian literary criticism uh, these are all people who were wanted to classify taxonomize uh, make all sorts of arcane sometimes v- very bizarre theories but uh, you know indian aesthetic theory rasa theory is very very vivid and absolutely usable even today so i think the task for the writer is to go past your you know that first frontier where uh, many of the motivations and play at work are actually the imperatives of the university system and the perpetuation of a certain kind of academia academic uh, careerism rather than an actual it's not uh, to me a lot of it doesn't seem motivated by the deepest love of literature of the kind i know from the writers who i love the best whom who whom i meet on a daily or a weekly or a yearly basis so that is my gold standard for literary criticism i i i need to see that love Uh, or sometimes you can have literary criticism of very brilliant and very detached mind you know it's it's often destructive rather than constructive or analytical rather than creative but there's a certain kind of erudition in it that you cannot r- refuse so in the in that sense i would not close my door to any possibility but 
you know, you have a sixth sense for what seems promising and what is not. And in that sense, I think a lot of, we are lucky that a lot of writers write brilliant literary criticism and, uh, you know, somebody like Mario Vargas Llosa or... Um, V.S. Pritchett uh, actually write a paragraph as beautiful in their literary criticism as they would do in their novels. And for them, it's just, you know, it's it's actually a free flow of thought across the frontiers of their mind. And they just move this way and that way. And that, I think, is really nice. There's another place where you've spoken about how, quote, the jobbing book reviewer should take pause before he claims the status <laughs> of either literary critic or essayist. And I claim both in this book. <laughs> Stop, quote. And about literary criticism, again, you've spoken uh, of it, how a great bulk of literary criticism today, quote, shows the rigor of a certain literary critical method or theory of literature, even if it sometimes thereby recuses itself from the realm of the lay reader or just as problematically jettisons questions of aesthetic value in favor of social or political questions or subsumes literary creation to theoretical superstructures. Stop quote. But later when you speak about, you know, the, the highest form of literary criticism, you write even higher on this scale, therefore, is a book review or work of literary criticism that aspires to the status of an essay. That is a distinctive combination of objective and subjective perceptions written up in an unmistakable individual voice, possessing and proposing nuances of thought, perception and style that enact the pleasures of thinking, feeling and reasoning about art and seeking to recreate the drama of literary engagement in a language that itself incarnates those qualities that make literature the most elevated side of that universal human currency and connector language. Then a book review can become all of these things, literary criticism, essay, literature, stop quote. And when you're first starting out at that point where you want to think about books and write about books and all of that, what were sort of your early models? Like today, today you can, you know, articulate it so beautifully <laughs> and put it like this. It sounds and much nicer when you read it out. I'm, I'm, I'm entirely persuaded by what you've just read. <laughs> you better be persuaded by it because you wrote it. And uh, yeah, uh, so, but today you can write it like that. And today you have, you can, uh, in retrospect, look at all your models like, you know, uh, Pritchett and so many others. But when when you're starting out, do you have any models? What is yes. a book review? Yeah, yeah, you you are, uh, you are actually are very good models because uh, and in this way I'm grateful at least for the small time I spent in the West. You know where I don't think I learned a huge amount from my university degree, but uh, buying the newspapers on the weekends you could uh, you know at the time the Guardian had a eight or twelve page book supplement, and as I've written even in this essay, you know you suddenly found as you didn't. You still don't in India anywhere, uh, other than in a couple of specialist book review journals. You don't find that a book review supplement in a newspaper. Perhaps there was a Hindu literary review. And somewhere I found lots of names, which are also the names of novelists, all writing short essays or book reviews in a very sparky style, seven or eight hundred words. Was, in a way, it was a bit like the journalistic equivalent of the term essay or the weekly essay I used to write as a student. And I thought, this is a very nice jump to make, a lateral you know how they talk about lateral entry into the civil services, a lateral entry into literary, literary criticism. And uh, this to me, you know, and uh, also uh, uh, this is where I feel so disappointed sometimes when newspapers, a newspaper is the perfect place to write about books. There's no better place anywhere. Uh, even a book is not such a good place to meet a book as a, as a newspaper is in some strange way because a newspaper can enact a fellowship of books. You know, if a six page book review section can have all sorts of books about, you know, imagine India if you could set one up uh, uh, and get everyone to write with integrity another problem of its own kind. Uh, you'd, you know, you'd have the newest ideas, the what you have in a verbal realm with the seen and the unseen, you know, in a in a uh, in a literary realm, you would have people parsing ideas about politics, society, culture, history. You know, a, a very deep exploration of a small subject, a very broad exploration of a large subject. All these things next to each other, and if you as I did, you know, read it week after week, after a year or two, suddenly realize, you know, your mind is much more flexible. You can run up and down the channels of thought and you also have an opinion to contribute. You know, that is the main problem that young students, you know, I hope there will be some young, you know, this is, that young students in literature, this is the problem they feel, the anxiety of those who appear to know what they're saying, the pressure from those voices is so great that you say, how can I ever hope to match my own? I don't have an opinion. My opinion is just a combination of other people's opinions linked up in some very, you know, in a way that I think will please the person who's correcting my exam paper. That is the usual like term essay or exam paper in, 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 in a BA. But once you go past that and when you see all these voices, uh, I think I suddenly just want, I, I had this goal. I want to see myself on those pages. I don't want anything else right now. 
I want, you know, like somebody turning the page to like the fellowship of those writers to be on the same page as them. And that was my, I think my, goal, my only limited goal of my 20s. I want to be on the book review pages of the good newspapers of the world and uh, to earn my spurs uh, that someone doesn't know me can read a paragraph or two and say, okay, wh whether or not this chap will ever be a writer, he knows there is that love of literature that comes through. And obviously, as I said, the middle stage was also a great practicing ground for that because I could double, triple my audience and uh, actually have a space where people would come to read just my book reviews, not just a book review where they would find me. And, and there's a role for serendipity there also, yes. right? Because I think of the role of serendipity in my life. And <laughs> obviously, you and I are sitting across the table because serendipity brought us together yes. in a way, right? Otherwise, we may have vaguely known of each other and never actually been friends. And... Uh, you know, you speak of the serendipity in your life where, uh, you know, 2002, you're a lit student in Cambridge and you're about to eventually come back home to do whatever and you're terrified of what life in India will be like. And then you come across this interesting, was it classified or was it an ad? Or It was an ad uh, on a student notice board. Yeah, so so tell me a bit about that and <laughs> what that, you know, what had light bulbs going off in your head because of that. You know, at some point you are so desperate in life and uh, in that sense, I agree that a literary humanities education doesn't prepare you for the sudden brutality and cruelty of life in the outside world. But even so, I think finding your feet, I, I look back on those years actually as uh, with s some degree of affection and pride because uh, it, it, was, it, it was interesting to work out, you know, it, like I say at some point, you had to work out how to become a small entrepreneur in literature, right? A few book reviews a month, somewhere or the other, patched together living, try to become a writer on your own. In the meantime, meet your friends and not not such a bad way to live uh, on balance. Uh, a bit hard in Bombay sometimes with money, but uh, and um, yeah, so little bits of good luck. And I was already writing a few book reviews, but when I saw this notice and there was hard cash being promised right there, I kind of felt this is for now. This is my way. It was an ad asking for book reviews. Yes, and saying mm -hmm. uh, the, there's a hundred pound payment for reviews that are accepted. And like I said, I never found out where they got published. In the early years of the internet, this was also possible that you know many newspapers uh, didn't have. What was very strange, you had to write two versions of the same review. Again, great practice for writing, editing, cutting, revising. And one was 3,000 words and one was 1,000 words. You know, 3,000 word review is, today is unheard of. But sitting down and writing these enormous pieces actually, you know, was great discipline at the time. And most importantly, it was something that I was doing. You know, your motives are always a combination of wanting to do the work and the financial. Uh, they are, uh, both are very important. But to make money from doing what you... Uh, at the time, I don't think I was capable of much else except perhaps a touch of cricket journalism, which I also then took up. But uh, staying on one's home ground and making money from literature was a very thrilling experience. Uh, small amounts though they were. And I think I kept that up for a long time. And uh, what was the best thing was, uh, which I still love about book reviewing, that you have, uh, it's like meeting a person every week, a new person, usually at their best. You know, if you think of a, how long it takes to write a book, usually every writer would say a book is who I am, but at the best level that I am, not just random, uh, not just the sentences like mine where, you know, pause, run off in some direction. It's all polished, well-written, well-thought, uh, revised. And uh, to live at that level of language week by week is... Uh, is a very good education and it's a good way to live as well. You know, you realize words have to be taken seriously. Those people who do have a certain kind of wealth and riches, once you live at that level, you set yourself higher standards and you meet different kinds of styles. You know, you realize some writers write a hundred word sentence one after the other. Some others have a very staccato style. And uh, in making notes to, somebody recently asked me at a literary festival, you know, give me two tips. I also want to write book reviews, but I'm struggling to do it. Give me a tip for how to how to write one. I said, you know, I, I can't, It's there's not a formula. But uh, if you are struggling to write one, do something, make notes as you read of all the sentences that you like. And then before you start to write, look at the back of your book where you've scrawled all these sentences, pick one out, copy it out. That is the opening line of your book review. The very fact that it has struck you as essential or interesting shows that there's something in there, whether stylistically or, or content-wise, that gets to the center of the book. Then start to explain. Don't say, now I'm going to explain why I chose this sentence, but 
in actually start doing that you know saying uh, in so and so's book uh, these words show that something is happening etc and you go on from there and you, from then on you'll find the words flowing just run run down the line you know uh, your the biggest problem that the blank page is solved use the writer to solve your problem and then add something to the writer's voice but there are all these little things that you find out and like i said you know there's something I, another f- the reason why i have this romantic feeling towards book reviewing is that for lots of people who, who do it with real passion in a way you're pouring the best of your writing into praising or occasionally cutting down or criticizing somebody else's writing and i say at some point you know literary critic you can there can be many definitions but one of them is a, a, a basically a writer who uh, uses his or her best sentences in the service of somebody else's book and i think there's something generous in that even now when i find my book reviewed by somebody where there's an actual passion or a real engagement involved i really feel very grateful and all writers feel grateful for that level of engagement even if perhaps the the reviewer says the book was a bit disappointing you'll take that over a flat good review any day i think yeah we're actually recording this on april uh, 12th so this will this episode might even come out in june because i'm banked so much in advance <laughs> but the episode i released yesterday was with someone i realized now is a f- good friend of your shruti kapila yes and i was just thinking of like the one sentence from her book which uh, really stood out for me yes. and i don't know if she would accept that it is central to her book or mm. whatever but it stood out for me was a uh, quote hindutva is a theory of violence in search of its history Tremendous, sure. tremendous. That's a tremendous, tremendous. Sentence. Yeah, yeah. This is. Uh, it's a very good line. A uh, very good line to pick up, and you realize even in prose works of great depth, detail, and density, you make little leaps from single sentence springs. Yeah, such as this one. Yeah, and then you can expand and embroider and articulate your theory. But you still, in that sense, literature is so so sly and artful in the way it works. The deepest things happen. In 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 two or three seconds, and then again you go on that slow, <laughs> slow path. And uh, there's another beautiful passage I'll uh, uh, read out, and it's resonant with me for different reasons. This passage, and one reason is resonant with me is that so many of us today take the internet for granted, even computers for granted. Mm-hmm. Like early in your essay, you talk about how you were so happy to have a refurbished <laughs> laptop, as it were, where you could sit in your room and have to write. And even I remember my, uh, you know, in the late '90s, how desperately I wanted a yes. computer of my own, and what a big deal it was. And yes, we take it all for granted. But speaking of the internet, I'll just read this passage out where. Once you started reviewing and you were at Cambridge, you write quote. I found I love to browse the archives of the book review pages of the New York Times by typing in the names of writers who had floated into my consciousness: Tolstoy, Henry Green, Konstantin Kavafy, Gabriel Mistral, and reading everything that had been published about them over the decades. And then everything I could find by the writers who had written something interesting about one of them. Everything was something in itself and a link to something else. stop quote and i find this delightful because it's like there is this sea of knowledge mm. and associations out there and then by choosing to write you are jumping into that sea yes, yourself yes yes you know so how much of your reviewing craft as it were like i would imagine that someone learning to review say in 1992 yes as opposed to 2002 would become completely different because in 1992 your references would be so limited yes your sense of what is possible what is permissible hmm. would be uh, so small hmm. but over here suddenly everything is open to you so how did how did you approach it who were mm-hmm. sort of your models were there did you have an ethic of writing book reviews that these are the things i will do and these are the things i won't do hmm. just in terms of approach how did you sort of hmm. uh, Well, my initial models were all entirely Western, only because there was the space in uh, in 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 Western literary culture for this sort of work to happen much more so than in India. Bizarrely enough, once I came back to India and started work here, obviously I found many very good Indian literary critics who had uh, or reviewers who had till then had somehow you know you, if your parents bought one newspaper and you lived in Bombay, you would never end up knowing these names. At the time, there wasn't that connection. You know, Ashia Satta, Nilanjana Roy, Shama Futeh Ali, Minakshi Mukherjee, all the range of uh, you know. first rate literary writers uh, whom i came to later but at the time it was mainly you know the good newspapers of the world the washington post uh, where i published my first proper book review and when that check came i'll never forget the moment uh, and it was only because of your your laptop that you could even in england it was hard to get a american newspaper but you could so in that sense yes for people of our generation there's two loves you can never forget the first girl you fell in love with and the first laptop you ever <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I still have it. I can't bear to give it away. I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, in some old cover of mine, and uh, that sense of freedom also comes from you know. In that sense, it's good to have a what is called a naive youth because when you start suddenly climbing up the mountain 
uh, of literature it is so exciting that you can't even bear to sleep because next morning you get up and start the climb again and there's always a new challenge in front of you and every day your language improves your vocabulary improves your sense of detail improves so you can like with everything else you know repetition is the mother of skill and you get better by uh, you i think I'm, i i used to make uh, in my 20s i used to be so upset by reading a bad book including a bad book by a good writer and every writer has a right to write a few bad books you know it's not possible always to keep up even quality <laughs> i get so upset at having wasted 3 or 4 days that i would write a very sarcastic a cutting review sometimes i would not want to do that anymore but equally i think it was you know one should not lose that uh, uh, pugilistic sense of saying you know this is not worth someone's time and i'll detail in a 100 with a 100 reasons why it's not so there's some reviews like that in my book as well i cut a few others out thinking i don't want to keep these animities there by concept creating them into print um, because it is upsetting as a writer i know to have somebody say bad things about your book but it has to be done sometimes and everyone should also have this experience just so that you know what it's like on each side so um, after that you know it's all determined like the book reviewing is the ultimate improvisational art somebody says 800 words somebody says 400 words somebody says 1200 words what points you will pick up what argument will make all depends on what day of the week it is how much time you had to think about it but over the years you know i was for a while i was the weekly book critic of lounge i used to write 50 60 70 i think 2007 or 70 book reviews a year uh, it was like a mini factory for every four days you ch- send one out the next one comes in at the same time updating my blog no wonder it took me so long to write my first novel but uh, it was very exciting morning till night the life in literature uh, this way or that way somebody else's book your book somebody else's book reviews your book reviews uh, little bits of talk and drinking at your place in the middle <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to make sure one actually saw a human face but otherwise it was just the face of a page for so long <laughs> before we get back to the biographical part of it which which i do want to uh, you know go down step by step but b- before that a couple of questions uh, now w- i'll read out another passage from your book where at one point you write a book is only one text but it is many books it is a different book for each of its readers my anna karenina is not your anna karenina your arzi the dwarf is not the arzi the dwarf that i wrote when we think of a favorite book we recall not only the shape of the story the characters who touched our hearts the texture of the sentences we recall our own circumstances when we read it where we bought it and for how much what kind of joy or solace it provided how scenes from the text began to intermingle with scenes from our life how it roused us to anger or indignation or allowed us to make our peace with some great discord this is the second life of the book its life is our life a uh, stop quote and therefore you could argue that there are as many yes. like each book has as many versions as <clears throat> there are readers uh and now is this an impediment or an opportunity for someone who is reviewing a book because on the one hand it may feel like an impediment because the only uh, notion of the book that you can possibly capture is defined by your limitations and your life yes. but on the other hand it can be an opportunity because you can make your reading of the book that much richer by pouring the personal into it as well hmm. and this is something i discussed with our mutual friend jay arjun singh when we yes. did an episode on hmm. film criticism like one of the things that i really liked about his film blogging hmm. was that once he found his voice yes. it was imbued with the personal it yes. was not just about a cinema But yes what he feels about that what it makes him feel and all of that which i think made the whole experience richer so hmm. we can approach this both as a feature or a bug but is this something you've thought about and- yes 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 because it ends it, it ends up being endlessly discussed in literature and uh, also you know uh, it it raises its head in a very banal sense you know you could say if all readings are therefore subjective every reader has his own version of a book what is the difference between a book review and amazon reviews of a three or four lines or whatever a star review or whatever so So, um, uh, uh, my way of breaking this question down is that you know, of course, everyone's o- opinion is somewhat subjective, and you can bring many kinds of readings to a book. Some of them necessarily the result of your own past or what you can see in a book. Even so, a very deep subjectivity is a kind of objectivity. in my view somebody who really wrestles with the book and pick out all sorts of things from it and uh, you know just because you bring yourself to the book doesn't mean that the your book is that book is also not released to its greatest self by you uh the two can really meet and both sides are giving something w- very uh, deeply of themselves and that is the encounter that you record and you don't always have to make it dramatic therefore saying you know this moved me or whatever just the writing itself will show how much you invested of your of your heart your mind your soul into it uh and uh, there are certain technical aspects of uh, you know literary criticism like no matter uh, your 
your uh, Anna Karenina can be different from mine, but you might not want be able to say a lot about it other than you liked it or you like some character. Whereas uh, um, uh, another kind of reader would could follow the, for instance, uh, the changing meanings of a certain word. Let us say love, in Anna's mind, as Tolstoy shows it across the face of the book and, you know, be able to develop arguments, perhaps not only about the book itself, but linking that book to the general ideas of love in Russian culture, in world literature. So there's infinite pathways you can create. And the more you read, the more adept you become at making links. That's why in the later uh, sections of my book, I begin to write essays about two writers and three writers, not just one writer, showing how you can r raise r your game up. So sometimes some comparisons become very fruitful, you know, a Russian writer with an Oriya novelist, they would have never met each other. But if there's a, a similar note in their work, how, what is the differences in the way they approach it? And are they both, can the reading of both be improved by being set in conversation with one another, as it were. You know, Jugal Bandi is a very classic feature of Indian art, and I really appreciate, you know, that we have such a deep artistic tradition that can be applied to literary criticism as well. Bring people together and see what they say, and the comparisons reveal things about each other that a single analysis won't. And in that sense, I really believe, you know, there are better readings. Every reader has his own book, a version of the book, but there are better readers and there are less good readers. And there's nothing to feel ashamed of. There are many readers I meet on a daily basis who I know are superior readers to me. That doesn't mean that, you know, like uh, I, I still rate myself as a reader and a writer, but I know there are some things they can do that I can't do. I would like at some point to slowly move upwards till perhaps at the age of 80, I'll write the perfect essay. And then one can head off to the next library, wherever that is. Let, let's take a digression on reading then, you <laughs> yeah. know, and the, 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 the question that is, how does one read a, a book? And the, any, uh, um, the, the, the most primal way of reading a book is you read it for the story. This happened, that happened next, and you're kind of just reading it like that. Mm. And later on, you begin to find other ways of reading a book. And some of it, of course, is enhanced by the criticism that you read. For example, uh, I remember reading Ma uh, Madame Bovary as a child mm. and then coming across, uh, you know, James Wood's excellent uh, yes. essay on it where uh, uh, he speaks about the book and speaks about the use of the free indirect voice. Yes. And then reading Madame Bovary again. And it's like an education. It's like everything has been stripped away. You understand so much, not just about a particular book, but about craft and language and everything. And it's, um, yes. you know, and that kind of happens. So now, you know, when, and, and this is something my writing students also ask me sometimes that, how should I read? And now one aspect of reading is, of course, intentionality, hmm. where you can perhaps say something concrete that read it in this way. But yes. the other aspect is that how you read is also a function of how much you have read before yes. and how much of that you're bringing into something that uh, you have read. So, you know, do you have any thoughts on this, especially because in a sense, every reviewer or um, uh, literary essayist like yourself must carry two readers. And mm. one reader, I suppose, is someone who is just reading a book for the enjoyment of yes. it, with any other thoughts being pure asides. Mm. But another mode of reading that you, of course, do is where you're thinking deeper, where you're making all of these connections, where you're reading Proust and you're saying, ah, mm. Nausgaard did this here and so and so, Oriya writer yes. did this there and you're making those connections and that. So is it so that there are those two modes of reading with some kind of continuing between them for you? Mm. And if you had to advise people on how to read, mm. you know, what would you, what, what would you say? Well, there may have been two modes at a certain point of time when you're starting out. For me now, there's just one mode. I don't read, read everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the internet, you know, when you're reading pieces that have deliberately not been written to do anything other than instruct or explain something, you don't need to attach that deeper. You, though even their style is very important, I find. Uh, but uh, otherwise, when you're reading something that has been set up as a kind of machine, uh, to uh, one can use other words, but a kind of machine for releasing verbal pleasure, you know, you have to look at the controls and the writer is himself or herself given some cues with punctuation, uh, structure, all these things uh, that you have to unpack and relive the book inside your head. And for that, you know, you have to give your best self to it. And uh, when the book is good, you must be good. I mean, don't distract yourself with other stuff. Keep your phone away. Read 10, 15 pages at a time. Not a few sentences here or there. Give a certain hour of the day to reading, preferably the first hour of the day, if you can manage it and you're not rushed to go somewhere. These would be my advices for young readers or writers. Uh, give the best of yourself to a book because the very definition of a book is somebody giving the best of themselves. So if you, both of you approach the situation in the same spirit, that's when you can unlock whatever, you know, 
just as in life you are uh, as a body you are what you eat as a reader you are what you read and you have to re- learn to read well but of course it's frustrating at the beginning because there's such a long tradition to absorb so i would say if you want to be a novelist you must read 50 novels naively perhaps not picking up everything about them before the path becomes easier but that much time you must struggle so it's helpful to read a novel every week get it out of the way in a year or two and then start to slow down and pay attention read the great indian canon in a way my book is also a little a snapshot of all the things that that could be everyone's canon will be different because we are such a big country but uh, at the very least we must read indian books books in translation books from all other every other continent it's possible to do that now why limit yourself put it all together in your own map and and you, you you speak of reading the great indian books and the uh, great indian canon and all that and i had another question about this because your training in uh, literature in whether you did your ba in xavier's and then you went to cambridge and yes. whatever would have been kind of from a western perspective mm. and this brings across a problem like in one of your essays you've quoted fakir mohan senapati's book six acres and a third yes. and you've written that ask a new babu his grandfather's father's <laughs> name and he will hem and haw the narrator chirps but the names of the ancestors of england charles the third will really be roll of his tongue <laughs> which is yeah it's just kind of true it's and true. later you quote a uh, boy tonkin where tonkin in an essay on nagi mehfuz's uh, cairo yes. trilogy at one point talks about how the book quote in act a dialogue between egyptian ways of seeing and european ways of knowing yes. stop quote which struck me as really interesting phrases so deep uh, yes yeah and then in another essay you refer to how you know ramanujan's famous uh, essay of 1990 where, which was titled is there an indian way of thinking mm. and you spoke about how quote uh, and these are your words in the closing years of the 19th century the oriya writer fakir mohan senapati appears to have asked himself that question in another, uh, in another form is there an indian way of writing a novel mm. stop quote this gets me to thinking about what happens when you bring a prism of looking at literature that is a western prism yes. shaped by western literature with its values and mores and all of that mm-hmm. and you bring it and you're looking at indian literature like that yes. and is it even fair like i did in uh, a wonderful episode with sarah rai a munshi premchand's granddaughter and a re- really yes. fine writer herself yes and i asked this in the context of premchand because yes. one there is no denying that premchand is a heck of a writer yes. but there's also no denying that if you look at his work through a western prism Yes. It will be very easy to pick flaws with it but yes. are there really flaws or is it the prism that we are looking through? So uh, since you seem to sort of combine the art of uh, literary criticism with also this deep abiding affection for Indian books yes. or books by Indian authors in the, in the different languages. Yes. What 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 are your thoughts on this? Uh-huh. You know the very fact that I'm uh, I'm so touched to see that you pulled out three different points and very far uh, distant uh, points of my book to make uh, piece together one question itself showing that you know this is the, this is a sort of reading for which I have the highest regard even if it's the reading of my own book I'm very happy you know there is lovely that a question can be enunciated in these kinds of detail and yes I think that is the problem or the interesting question the puzzle as there should be puzzles in writing <laughs> the puzzle for the Indian novelist today how do you write Indian novels in English many people will have answered that before me and what sort of inheritance you bring to bear uh, i'm going to read one uh, uh, it's uh, although it looks you know like this example of premchand a lot of early indian novels are very derivative of western forms because there's that pressure of imitation of their authority saying this is how it should be done you do it just change the names of the characters and the uh, situations but it has got to be written with that in the didactic style a, a little passage from my country's literature The novel literary history tells us had its beginnings in the birth of modernity in the west in societies like India and Egypt Brazil and Korea it was a transplant but wherever the novel went it merged with that world's indigenous storytelling traditions and reappeared with a new face and form a new way of being it was the literary version of the traveler who makes himself at home anywhere he or she goes and this i think is the wonderful thing about novels you know that and this is what boyd tonkin is also in that wonderful book of his finally arriving at so using the western the classic western form of the novel in writing novels about your own society is an intermediate stage a necessary intermediate stage in any in any novel's journey into a culture and slowly slowly those those uh, paraphernalia begin to fall away the scaffolding begins to fall away and uh, inside a new work of building is going on and obviously some geniuses arrived at this answers much earlier than the others so you know uh, that's that's why i think indian literature is always being renewed even by the past not just by the future because in translation new books come into view that have been lost for so long senapati's novel only in 2006 when i read it when i was 26 i suddenly realized this could be another way of working 
not now perhaps in the future where the novel is told not in the first person or in the in the third person but in the first person plural we the voice speaking the narrator seems like a, a plural voice which is you know you've very rarely seen something like that which so successfully brought off that you realize this is almost like the voice of the voice of the village chorus or the panchayat kind of speaking and he just doesn't say it but that's what you understand novels have to have lots of secrets in them and uh, in that sense i think the novel you know in the last 30 40 years when you put together all the indian the different novels from all the languages in india each of which has a kind of slightly separate or different novelistic pathway and tradition uh, you realize that we are actually the center of the of the novel in the world we, we ourselves perhaps don't know it and we can't also find all the novels in other languages but from above if one were to be a, a the, the the novel as a concept suddenly embodied in a bird or a you know a cloud and looking from above drifting over the world it stop over india and say i don't I, i want to stay here this is where the most interesting stuff is going on and then you know you realize uh, also every novel must have generational you know people speak in different ways from generation to generation even the bombay of today i don't think when we were growing up uh, people used you say the word chapter for a particular kind of eccentric character are wo chapter hai that the way they say now on the uh, here the it's always renewing itself language is always renewing itself in uh, in living speech and the sense the novelist work is to record living speech even perhaps not necessarily through a direct direct transposition you know if i were to write bombay or hindi in my english novels it would look odd a patchwork but i can find an english to sort of replicate those rhythms or i can find other strategies there are many and in a way the novel is like life in that there's no formulas at all for every book you have to just like with life you have to invent your solutions for that piece of material and after a while you learn to trust yourself and let go of the precedents and say it doesn't matter and sometimes you may make things confusing to your readers because in the end you know there's this basic tension between novels and cap- capitalism they are sold in a capitalistic world but capitalism prizes reliability uh, repeatability what is promised is what is delivered uh, the classic things that good brands do well the very raison d'etre of novels is to always surprise you and like you know like to 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 sell you short and take you somewhere else even if it means having all these quotes on the top you know this is a cross between polo coelho and dan brown etc etc and this is why i think the good novels are so wonderful they you never know what is going to happen in the next page you might know what's going to happen in the story the story is revealed to you even in the synopsis but moment by moment the situations that emerge uh and as a writer it is so exciting to write once you are in it you know it's very frustrating till the time you can't get the hang even of your own book but i think the greatest highs of my life have been this 5 6 7 month periods when i knew i don't have to work to think what i'm going to write tomorrow i just sit there the past the momentum of the past 3 4 years will immediately it's almost like you're in communion with the secret spirit of the novel uh, not that you have some special you know uh, pass or anything like that it's just that you've done the groundwork and you've done the reading and then for a few months you will have this amazing dance with an abstract idea that you see playing itself out inside your own mind and that i think separate from reading novels this is the pleasure of writing them that you feel you cannot get it perhaps you can get it a little bit from falling in love with a person or <laughs> or uh, rummaging through very deep memories but you can use those for novels as well so a novel even <laughs> deep memories of falling in love <laughs> put them put it in a novel and you've got it all together <laughs> yes so i w- i want to ask a question about expectations and conventions and whether we are imprisoned by them in mm. this sense that you've written for you write a review for the washington post yes. and then for the longest time you came back to india and you were a weekly reviewer for mint and we'll talk about that as well where you were being paid a pittance which i only found out while reading your essay <laughs> and 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 then you go on to uh at the same time you're writing reviews for a whole bunch of foreign publications now i would imagine that there there's a certain expectation of what a review is hmm. it is not even as much their expectation as just an understanding that is there because you have spent all this time reading all the reviews that come there uh, reading all the literary essays that are published and saying oh hmm. this is how it is and this is how i structure it and these are the kinds of things i hmm. uh, write about and draw connections from and yes. therefore in a sense that is a um, convention that you've set for yourself which you're not necessarily you don't have to follow any of them on your blog yes. but that's a convention when you're writing those reviews similarly when you're writing a novel there are conventions yes. uh, of how you kind of go about it and there'll be conventions in the west and you'll find that people uh, in india have done various other things yes. like this novel with the v yes. narrator right 
like i understand that every constraint is also liberating in the sense that once you know where the parameters are you yes. just go for it and you can do whatever within the, within that but at the same time do you then start a uh, thinking as the years go by about how i can uh, break out of this convention like on an in an unrelated field perhaps i had the journalist i was about to say data journalist but i don't want to type caster the the journalist rukmini s here yes. uh, sitting exactly where you're uh, sitting mm. and we recorded an episode and she was complaining about the structure that's almost become a cliche for data journalism mm. that you start with a human story so you want to humanize <laughs> the data yes. and then you get into the data and mm. she's like that one it's a cliche and two it can also be misleading because you can pick any damn story for any damn whatever yes. so is is this something you've thought about over the years because one of the sort of uh, perks of being forced to read as widely as you are yes. is that you are then also forced to uh, reconsider yes. all these um, uh, parameters that mm. have been set by others for so what are your thoughts on this yes you know i've been very lucky that you know as soon as my first book came out uh, i was able to live a life where sometimes my book walked ahead of me and people knew me because of my book rather than knowing me as me suddenly my, my access to novels remained the same my access to novelists went up by like a thousand percent <laughs> <laughs> much more than that even you know suddenly you could speak to somebody as an equal and other people looked looked at you as an equal you, you once you've written one novel you a good novel you're a novelist for life i mean you don't need to write and you you want to write more but it does, it, nobody can take that badge away from you and um and in that sense you know uh, i had the very exciting thing of sometimes i'd go in residencies or meet people on a festival or run into them somewhere and in 2 or 3 hours you could go over the entire history of novels as you knew it and as they knew it and compare your ideas and you could use them as springboards to jump ahead for i think till about till i wrote my first novel i was still a fairly traditional novelist i don't think i then grew as a novelist so much by reading novels as by talking about novels with other novelists who were f- so far ahead of me in their understanding of what to do with story and how to arrange them that those conversations were what I live for and in particular I remember my israeli writer friend probably just my closest friend in literature even today uh, ofi to shegafla who probably one of the most creative human beings i ever met um, you know the classic model of a writer is you know he lives to write Uh, I had the very good fortune of spending almost three uninterrupted months in his daily company in a residency. Imagine the end of it, you know, I I I, I almost forgot who I was. You were so much under the influence of somebody else. But as the years have passed by, I've managed to you know again return to some of the ideas, and we meet every two years anyway, and uh, uh, catch up and talk again, talk about books, and you can even talk about the same book that you loved and take th- different things away from it. You know. high grade conversation between two people who work in the same form and about breaking conventions you know in the end the fi- the the when you take the idea of the novel that i just explained it should surprise it should be do something new to its logical conclusion every novel should be written in a way that no other novel can be but you know that is not possible that would be also an absurd world where the reader would have to learn the ropes every time over imagine putting that pressure on readers so it's got to be some mix of sticking to the form and making little nicks and cuts or changes so that you show that you're also criticizing the form that it the way it was your innovations don't have to happen on a major structural scale they can merely happen you know i know this friend of mine saskia jain who in writing dialogue often end sentences with the word hhm hmm Mm. and the first time i thought i said this is such a natural way of putting pauses and sounds into speech which i it has never occurred to me although you hear it all the time novelists give you new eyes for how the world really works and uh, in big and small ways and i think in the end the small ways of noticing are perhaps the more valuable because the big ways you know the sociologists the political scientists also keep on bringing to you that level of knowledge creation is happening the way in which life changes through some small detail you begin to think you you a new word enters the culture from somewhere and the use of that word slowly transforms an entire society those are the things that novels you know are very good at doing uh, the the flow of an idea or a person through time and the analysis of time itself and in that way you know novels can never run out of uh, you know because even our sense of what time means has changed so much in the last 20 years i find myself unable to keep up with the, the idea of how i still perhaps I, i cannot analyze what has happened in the last 20 years in a novel at the at the level of experience of digital time and what it means to you know keep on flipping between an instagram post a facebook then a sentence here i'm i'm perhaps not even interested in that to me 
um, since we are older, it's not as interesting as it might be to someone younger. But uh, so I think what finally one must remember that one is trying to break conventions, but the whole point of writing novels is not to break conventions, it's still to tell interesting stories. But you realize that since conventions can also be an impediment in telling a story interestingly, you use them and sometimes you move them out of the way and you create your own rules for the book. Perhaps you abandon it right after the book. And that actually respects the reader because you are saying to the reader, I don't completely agree with the inheritance. Here is my slight adaptation of life, writing, everything. And that is why you should read this book. A couple of questions. And, and one, again, goes back to the ways in which we have changed and I have changed. Is that, is that often when we are young, mm. we, uh, the way we behave implicitly we kind of see ourselves as, uh, you know, the central character of a play and everyone else is either just yes. a character or a prop, right? Yes. They're just props. And uh, and you see this on uh, social media all the time where people are all the time, you know, trying to raise their status by attacking others, by snarking on others, yes. and so on and so forth. A uh, little realizing that there are real people at the end of that. And when mm. people kind of do it to politicians and all of that, I understand because, you know, our taxes mm. are going and they're supposed to uh, <laughs> govern as well and all of that. You want to hold them accountable. But I, I, I'll i see random person attacking random other person with quote tweets and uh, yes. all of that. And I'm thinking that it's not it's not necessary just no. because you disagree with someone to attack them personally. And I, I think I've been guilty of that myself that even back in the old blogging days and I would of course in my India Uncut days do like five posts a day and um, did 8,000 posts in those five years and I remember that I would just give any comment on anybody and not give a shit because <laughs> it's like I am at the center of the universe and I'm passing judgment on people and all of that and unfortunately I think I did this to you also where once you had <laughs> did you you had written a review I felt really bad about it later you had you had written a, a review I think of Patrick French's book on Naipaul right yes uh, yes apples and oranges remember that now yeah and I felt that you were judging it on the basis of what you wanted it to be rather than what it was which was what uh, <laughs> I think Martin Amis had a quote about that if I remember correctly or somebody had a quote about that mm. so I put that quote out there and I, I put a link to your this thing and later I realized that what a dick thing that was for me <laughs> to do right like firstly it's a dick thing for to do to anybody <laughs> and to do a dick thing to one of your closest friends no no why should it so absurd uh, so no I'm just putting it out there because it's something that struck with me of, of uh, you know there are many little things that one regrets and mm. I, I remember that and the question that I'm going to ask you is that is that something as a young reviewer, mm. were you at any point also guilty of ignoring that in uh, retrospect? Mm. Because while you were writing about books, for you, you were diving into this great sea of knowledge and literature mm. and you're contributing to the discourse. But sometimes your words can be hurtful to yes. an actual real human being. They're not characters or props. Mm. Famously, uh, if I remember correctly, forgive me if I'm wrong, <laughs> I believe uh, Kiran Nagarkar actually fell physically ill after a review you wrote of one of his books. Oh, don't say that. Did, did, did this really happen? I'm sure it's one of those apocalyptic... I think you only told me. No, no. How Somebody told me about? that yeah, he, yeah. he took your... You, wrote, you savaged one of his books in a review and uh, <laughs> he apparently was so depressed by it and he actually fell ill. And <laughs> he died many years later, so you didn't kill him. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is in the realm of black humor, this is, this is, a, this is a new genre of literary black humor yeah, that you're opening and, and out this, here. This becomes especially more pertinent <laughs> when you become a Lit Festival regular hmm. and you're actually meeting all of these people all yes. the time. Well, I mean, there's so many things to say on a human and a literary level about these things. Of course, you know, uh, first of all, I mean, between you and me, I think we always, we, as I said, I enjoyed our disagreements. And uh, but I do remember now you bring it up, checking the, the blog, the comment section every two hours to see whether you'd reply. Then I would have to also jump in once more. And so it was like a long day. But I think between us, we always knew our disagreements are in good faith. And, you know, like, and upsetting each other is part of the game a little bit too. Also, you know, like uh, what uh, it brings out something in each other. And it's... It's, I mean, shall we put it another? It's a very masculine thing to do, and you know, it's a, it's a bit of a you know, uh, we can uh, enjoy that episode as something that you know, as part of our journey, and um, and uh, it was a, su a substantive point. I, I, as, as I remember now, I went into my library, pulled out five other literary biographies, and started quoting from this and that. So you know, it made me work harder. With literary criticism, you know, in the end, I think writers must realize that, you know, it's very easy to get a review wrong. And of course, you know, many reviews are also badly written. And sometimes they are also written, you know, with people who know each other. So it's an imperfect and impure form filled with lots of human 
motivations and errors they don't have to do with literature and you can end up mistaking one for the other and thinking you know this person didn't like my book because doesn't like me etc cetera, etc cetera. what can one do you know and one is in the social world where you end up much more now than 15 years ago where you end up meeting folk people should have a discipline to leave it at that and move on both on the receiving side and the giving side and uh, i know it can be hard but i think you know there's so many things are harder as a writer but why st- get stuck here i really think i mean when i meet some people who written something negative about my books i try not to bring it up ever or to even let it affect perhaps subconsciously still it does but i think one could have a perfectly pleasant relationship with if one were not to be able to do this basically it means that a bad review is war for the rest of your life i mean this is no way to live even literature says that what is the point of living like this if, if writing about books were to lead to this this problem you are left with a culture of empty praise which also sadly i think we have far too much the business of blurbs etc etc et so for all the problems and the people one may have hurt and the fact that one doesn't realize there's an actual person although you know people are hurt on a daily basis by so much else you know why should a lit- reviewer be singled out as being especially hurtful? you know come on to be honest the thing is you spend 5 6 7 years uh-huh, whatever uh-huh. it is writing a book and then you read a review mm-hmm. where the person will never know the book as well as you do so you feel wronged by it there is the criticism that you get for a book for uh, where the reviewer doesn't agree with what you have said or takes issue with your ideas Uh, and that i think no writer ever really feels deeply hurt by somebody disagreeing with the viewpoint when uh, th- there is the review that you must write when a book is very incompetently written or is actually prejudiced or malicious in some way and there i think one should reserve the strongest possible you know then it is a it's a rhetorical battle where you, the, there's actually something very damaging going on you know some kinds of argument that are present in india right now people extend those argument to book length forms if one were to say like take off your gloves and do not punch hard in in writing about these pieces even if it's from a different point of view you have to accept that you know this is a part of the um, world of debate and of ideas and one should take try to give everybody the benefit no, of no, doubt no i i agree with you i'm not argu- uh, talking about the normative <laughs> end i'm talking about the positive side of things the way things actually are yes. you know of course everyone should uh, you know not take reviews too hard mm. and just get on with the they job they don't and that's how it is that's how it is in most places and there are some people also skulk past when i see them in, <laughs> in certain rooms <laughs> saying that uh, but sometimes equally we have become friends later you know 5 10 years later and uh, since we are in this moment i will uh, like uh, supply the last ending to this nagar uh, unfortunate story because uh, actually i was thinking of him when i said you know like uh, you regret writing a very cutting piece about a less good book by actually a very good writer you know i think kakold is one of the greatest novels in the history of the indian novel it was very unfortunate it came out the same year as uh, the god of small things uh, when they were both equally good books and as a book about what the role music plays in human affairs i don't think i've read another indian novel that so deeply gets the place of music in indian life and uh, unfortunately that book didn't arrive i was only 18 when i was and you know suddenly a book pops up and somebody says will you review it and you start reading and you think it's very badly written you write it up you never realize but uh, uh, four or five years ago i was sitting at breakfast in a literary festival in kolkata and right next to me i saw a tall stooping kurtaard figure kurta pajama uh, mr nagarkar and all these years somehow i didn't know whether he actually knew me by face but whenever i saw him i realized you know this is not let's not whatever but i walked i changed my tables i walked up to him sat across the chair from him and sir I, i don't know if you remember me but i'm chandrahas and i remember many years this happened and i heard you were very upset by it and he said no no i wasn't and he, perhaps it was i don't know what it was and i said whatever it was i want to say sorry because i realized the ways in which i might have got that wrong or you got it wrong and that misperception or misimpression has stayed and i just want to make it clear you know i admire you as a very very great indian writer it was just that book that i was writing about I wasn't writing about you as a writer per se and he, very sportingly he said absolutely you don't need to explain so much i i get what you're saying completely and we had a i mean we didn't have a long conversation but we shared a coffee across the table and that's my last memory of him so you know I, while we are on the subject i want to acknowledge the generosity and grace of a very great writer coming back to that earlier subject you <laughs> mentioned about masculinity yes. and one often wonders whether this very great writer would have been as generous when he was say 25 <laughs> and chances are probably not you know you you maybe carry yes, that grudge yes, a little bit yes. so uh, l- let's talk about that because uh, before we started this when we were at breakfast you mentioned about how it might be harder to come to terms with yourself as a man then it is to come to terms with yourself as a human being yes which again struck me as one of those quotes if i read it in a book i'd write it at the back and then i'd follow <laughs> your hack and you know start my review with it uh, what do you mean by that 
Well, uh, there are many contexts in which that statement can be interpreted. But I, I think if I look at my life, I, I think I was saying in the context of my own life, I found it much harder to work out how to be a man. And perhaps every man in a in a time of 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 shifting very rapidly, shifting gender relations, has some version of this. Uh, it's harder to work out how to be a man than to be a human being. Not only in this present day sense of uh, revised gender, long overdue revision of gender norms, but also historically, you know, men have always found it difficult to be men. And uh, you know this uh, this dinner party conversation. What if women rule the world? Would we have so many wars? Would you there uh, would there be so much corruption? Would there be so much competitiveness? Uh, I don't know whether the answer is yes or no. There's certainly plenty of vicious and uh, women out there, but uh, I think we are not prepared by education to deal with certain aspects of our history, our psychological makeup, or if we are, it is only to repeat the forms of the past. And there are many unseen spaces we are not told what uh, we learn about sex from books and not from your mother or father. Uh, to learn about it from your mother would be a different thing from learning about it from your father. Strange though the thought may seem. I cannot imagine discussing this with my parents. And if your mother is listening to this, <laughs> like... <laughs> if there's anything I, you think I don't know, mommy, come on. Like I'm coming back home in three weeks. Let's sit down and have a chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the main, I, I generally I found uh, it's bizarre, you know, now uh, um, after my father passed away, I found myself in a two woman family, most of my 20s, my mother and my sister. And since then, I've either lived alone or back to all women families. Now I live with my wife, my daughter, and sometimes my mother-in-law also comes to stay over, particularly because she wants to have a chat with me. And strangely enough, I think back about my life and I had almost no close male friends in my 20s other than you and a couple of others. Now, I would say, bizarrely enough, my closest friends are all men. And what is the hinge on which this entire switch has occurred? Will it again change back to something else? Like, I, I think, I, I would say that my main success socially in my last 10 years, I was always interested in women and I always got along very well with them. I had many close women friends and I feel to whatever extent possible. I'm sure I have many misperceptions, biases, uh, whatever. But I get... I can sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with a woman. I found it much harder to set up the space with men. And partly it was not my fault, partly it was not the other side's fault. And whose fault was this? No one's fault. It's not really anyone's fault, but it is a problem to be solved. And in this way, I feel happy somehow in the last eight or nine years, uh, I find I can reach out to men, including a certain kind of South Asian. The only person I can't still get across to is a certain kind of South Asian man who lets, makes you want to do, who lets you do all the work in reaching them. You know, 99% of the work is yours and I will utter one or two words on this side and always make sure that they keep you at bay. I'm not interested in that sort of dialogue. But with almost everyone else, I think I've, especially I think having not had a very deep male presence in my life in my 20s, I think from about 30 onwards, I've really have a lot of father figures in my life. All the way from five or six years older to me to 30, 40 years older to me. You know, like, all the way from someone like a Pushpesh Pant to somebody who, you know, someone who might have met only two or three uh, years ago. And in this way, I think as a continuum of masculinity, I feel we've learned a lot from each other. The things I've learned from them, I think, I'm sure things I've given them. And between us, we make a good team in different countries and continents, though we may be. And whenever we get back together, there's more things to learn. And we give each other and we give outwards. I, we link up and we can create spaces for younger people like that. And this way, I feel, you know, we have not exactly solved, but we've definitely made a dent in this issue of men sort of not sharing a lot with each other. Uh, when you go to another man with a problem, they make jokes about you, so you retreat again, and there's that locker room style conversation. I don't know what it's like in sports teams. I'd be very interested to know. In the Indian cricket team, do they actually speak about girlfriends, sex, love, uh, if someone is depressed over a breakup, what sort of... You know, that would be a very interesting uh, crucible of masculinity, where you're both very hyper-masculine and you are trying to... Or you should be someone else. But at least in Indian life, I think this, therefore, this uh, notion of a gender above gender, a space above gender, that even while you're fighting the gender wars and in the gender things of time, I have a lot of sympathy for this idea that even in your deepest relationships, I believe in love, you know, when you marry somebody, you obviously carry your biographies as a man and as a woman and the conflicts and, you know, who cooks, who does the labor, who picks up the child or whatever. But at some level, I think as a 21st century man as a woman in any culture, Aside with the power and the politics, you must make the room to surrender and to forget who you are and become a 
how to put it a nameless human being just a human being and forget that mas- that inheritance of masculinity and femininity and be two human beings on a common cause in life and that there i think is a real space for dialogue even across gender and in marriage and all these spaces which have become a little hollowed out now because those norms have at the same time you know many for many of us marriage is something different from what it was for our parents and some people just don't are not interested in the idea for very good reasons but that's why if one is to revitalize the idea of marriage as well to my mind as a thinker as a writer this could be one way of doing it that we are not married as man and woman or as men and women we are married for some other reason to find how can we let go of our masculinity and femininity in a space where there's some other energy at work and uh, of course there's a practical element to this in your life but even as an idea these are the things that interest me and uh, to close on this i recently read a book that explained to me you know one of the pre- problems of talking about masculinity now is that uh, these days is that uh, feminist is an endless road <laughs> masculinity there's a block at every station because of the again that is a separate word with a separate history and uh, you your conversation can be interrupted or you actually have to find male only spaces where you can talk you know man to man in a different sense but i have a lot of respect for the ideas of robert bly you know the american poet and a very deep thinker on myth jungian psychology fairy tale religion where does this all mean and what what do these mean for modern life there's a book i recently found by iron john which i read with the greatest pleasure uh, about uh, the idea that it's basically a retelling over and over again of this uh, of a fairy tale from the grim brothers about uh, uh, a a beast and a wild beast near a pond and it being wounded in some sense i forget the exact story now but uh, it's a metaphor for there being a beast inside you whether as a man or as a human being i can only speak from my own experience and uh, you can never tame the beast and if you domesticate it too much you actually lose the energy that wildness that animal energy that you have how do you can you channel its energy so that it actually makes something positive in your life that aggression that spirit that that, that animal spirit to turn it from something destructive or the on the uh, volcanic into something that actually is uh, nurturing tender giving i think this is a challenge that all of us must face in the second half of our lives for you know where can you take it and uh, should you always be aware of it and uh, can you by thinking about it actually you know transform it from something you read to something inside you and where can you go with it and i think there's many precedents in india for that if you take the last millennium the sufi movement the bhakti movement uh, many movements to break down barriers are in as in some way linked to this sort of breaking down a barrier within your own self with the other inside you that's very resonant and uh, do you remember how the middle stage got named the middle stage <laughs> How did it? I forgot. When now. I started the middle stage, I based it on a quote by Theodore Dreiser, mm. which I'll read out for you. Quote: Our civilization is still in the middle stage, scarcely beast, in that it is no longer wholly guided by instinct. Scarcely human, in that it is not yet wholly guided by reason. Yes. Uh, stop quote. And I often think that the great mark of civilization, the struggle of civilization, in a sense, is that. we are taking control of ourselves like not let you know not letting our hardwiring control who we are in a sense you know nurture fighting back against nature not even nurture but mm-hmm. sort of using culture mm. to mitigate uh, some of the bad aspects of our hardwiring and all, a lot of yes. our hardwiring is of course contradictory and so yes. on and so forth and therefore i wonder like you know i've i've not thought of it in terms of masculinity or whatever mm. but one of the journeys that i've been forced to make and trying to make and and uh, i i don't i don't know if one can be completely successful is that journey where you are comfortable in your own skin yes where you can kind of reflect enough on yourself to realize why you do the things you do and then you can sort of come to terms with what you are yes. and uh, reconcile that with what you want to be mm. and find that kind of middle ground as it were yes. or you know go closer to that perfect w- version of yourself uh but i've never thought of it in masculine terms so obviously looking back as we were earlier discussing a lot yes. of the tendencies that uh, we had in our youth like that hyper competitiveness yes. or all of that uh, is a masculine thing yes you know and uh, is, is that kind of what you meant as well <laughs> 
I mean, obviously, yes. what we are mitigating this notion of the masculine is not just the instinctive ways in which we behave because yes, of yes, uh, yes. our hormones and so on, yes. but also the dangerous social notions of this is what men are and this is what women are, and yes. you dealing with that as well. Yes, yes, and trying to tra- transcend that for at least the people who know you to make another society. of people whom you know where you go past these ideas but uh, i was even struck by this, that quote about the middle stage you know um, in that quote by driser not not without reason he seems to end on the point by saying if we are all more guided by reason or mostly guided by reason we would be in a good place i tend to disagree with that and i think it was like a kind of fantasy of the enlightenment and of the west of the, of, of political life in the last 200 years again for, for which can contrary evidence is emerging on every single day all around us that uh, reasonable people are somewhere somewhat uh, and rationality in the end always yields good results since humanity is also fundamentally irrational i would argue that the problem is somehow to combine the rational and irrational into a package whereby neither of them destroys the other and that each has a space of free expression therefore your sport your art whatever these all actually th- theaters the irrational when they are t- t- taken out into politics family they can be very destructive but in the end i would finally say and this is also the insight of you know taoism and some kinds of philosophy that are not about language that there is some kinds of meaning that cannot be articulated in language and the more you grow as a writer you realize that this is true some poets know it some other kinds of thinkers know it and therefore actually you cannot reason your way out of problems even such as this one as like being comfortable in your own self you must have and i think i most closely came in touch with this idea in the last 7 or 8 years and now I firmly believe in it there to be certain breakout spaces moments relationships or encounters in your life where you take such a leap in those 2 3 days or whatever that you can never return to who you used to be before there's always you, that you plus who you what you experience or what you knew and those transformative little encounters those little jumps are actually uh, when combined with the more reasoned and planned trajectory that mix of rational and irrational in your own self actually makes for a very pleasant space where you also surprise yourself because there are ways in which you can surprise yourself and you have to then start plotting for ways in which you can surprise yourself do something new uh, i never was interested in agriculture now i think what almost every day uh, meet other kinds of folk and that way i think we also very lucky you know we have the chance to travel and live in different cultures travel to different places living for 3 or 4 months in brazil when i was 37 or 38 actually you know uh, even the fact of come here today wearing shorts uh, which i never used to wear before in public at the very least i grew up like a good indian man never shows his legs <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah me too boss I, i yeah so maybe uh, it's a vintage i never show my uh, uh, legs outside the house but. yes uh, i find the brazilian something that all all indians should go to brazil there should be some special diplomatic exchange where you know you reduce the fares and make a subsidy like the hajj uh, there should be a, like a soul pilgrimage to go to brazil uh, to learn the art of letting go uh, and of uh, of a giving physicality there's it's not like there's no bad touch in brazil as well there is but uh, i found that lots of men and women on the street when they meet each other they hug poke kiss uh, pinch uh, prod uh, squeeze uh, without the sense that you are uh, transgressing someone's personal space across gender and within gender both and as indians perhaps we are we imprisoned in both these spaces and suddenly i found it very liberating and i almost like this since you know one could any indian can pass over as brazilian after a few days of this you suddenly realize how pleasurable it is and uh, also the art of letting go and living in the moment you know we are brought up always thinking of security your flat your emi your rent your whatever don't do this beta whatever uh, you know in life as an adult you have to unlearn so much of what you have been taught and this is very important and i think again this is where perhaps both you and i are more comfortable with ourselves that we part of being more relaxed about who you are is learning how to enjoy yourself in the present moment it's of treating that present moment as a journey towards somebody else i don't want to become somebody else that that will happen in its own time right now who i am who i am today sitting across from you and the fact that we can channel our shared histories and our personal histories together in this space which has this energy the books of your library whatever you know this room this view this bombay the city that is the best you will be for that moment in time so once you can let go of these things and uh, stay stay where you are temporarily speaking it's really very pleasant and uh, <laughs>
what more can one say uh, this is something i keep reminding myself of like when i was young my ideas of happiness were tied up with goals yes i want to do this i want to write this book get this acclaim blah 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 mm. and i think as you grow older you realize that those goals are irrelevant maybe yes. they'll happen maybe they won't happen probably they won't happen but the important thing is that in the present moment you're blessed with so much yes and just sit back and enjoy that because uh there is sort of so much to uh, enjoy in that by the way about that whole brazil india exchange program thing <laughs> that they are touchy feely and you want to send young indian boys there <laughs> i ask you with folded hand emoji <laughs> kindly do not give these ideas to anybody in authority you know as especially brazil will not be very happy about this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps the young indian born so the boys will also learn that you know one can touch in a in a different way like to make somebody else feel comfortable as well uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's leave it for when we can actually take a ship and over we will we'll sort let's, it out let's then. not be condescending to young indian yes, boys also yes, you're yes. right there are many things about them that we on, might yeah on that generous note let's take a quick commercial break <laughs> and we'll continue our conversation <laughs> okay long before i was a podcaster i was a writer in fact chances are that many of you first heard of me because of my blog india uncut which was active between 2003 and 2009 and became somewhat popular at the time i love the freedom the form gave me and i feel i was shaped by it in many ways i exercise my writing muscle every day and was forced to think about many different things because i wrote about many different things well that phase in my life ended for various reasons and now it is time to revive it Only now I'm doing it through a newsletter. I have started the India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com where I will write regularly about whatever catches my fancy. I'll write about some of the themes I cover in this podcast and about much else. So please do head on over to indiauncut.substack.com and subscribe. It is free. Once you sign up, each new installment that I write will land up in your email inbox. You don't need to go anywhere. So subscribe now for free. The India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome back to the scene and the unseen. I'm chatting with my good friend Chandrahas Chaudhary on his uh, literary journey so far. And uh, let's get back to the chronological and the linear progression of your life. So in Cambridge, you start writing reviews. You get this chance. You write. Uh, you also write a review for the Washington Post. You start reaching out to others, and then you came back to India. and what's the scene then like what made you go for cricket journalism what made you join us at cricket info mm. and what was that period like because there were a couple of sentences kind of talking about how you how office life didn't really appeal to <laughs> <you>. so <laughs> tell me a little bit about what that period was like because i have <laughs> kind of been a witness to it but a witness to it from outside your skin so from inside <laughs> your skin tell <laughs> Well, what can one say? You know, uh, I, I think I should uh, preface any comments of mine by saying I probably was one of the worst employees anybody could ever hire. I might have looked superficially promising, but uh, I just cannot. Constitutionally, I cannot really work for someone else until I feel I'm part of the team, uh, a creative part of the team. I have some investment in that. So, uh, and especially when I was younger, I think I was. Um, it was even harder for me. I, just like you, I think from the age of seven or eight onwards, I spent my entire day, other than books, thinking about cricket, living, playing, dreaming all day long, and reading cricket books as well. Even you can combine cricket and literature. And finally, bizarrely enough, this was the path that opened out for me when I graduated from university. Now. these young people know even when they're 12 what they want to do in their lives at 23 i had no clue but i'd written a couple of cricket pieces doing an internship in wisden in england and uh, i think cricket info was starting up or looking for some new people and sambit bal wrote to me while i was still in england saying do you want to come to bombay and uh, uh, start uh, work for us here i was so delighted to be offered a job and in cricket as well not only was i very delighted my friends in university my indian friends were 10 times more delighted for me so they almost pressured me into taking up this offer because they said, like can't be anything greater than cricket is your work whereas for us we they, they used to watch it on the side uh, from the investment banks or whatever so i came back and was very happy and i couldn't wait to start work i think i even curtailed uh, my vacation in england i was so keen to enter that world of employment and you know going to work and being part of you know the economy etc and it was very exciting you know i i remember very vividly the first time coming in and you go to office and you feel very grown up etc but 
in the end, uh, as I think so many of us, uh, it, it's strange how many writers emerged from that three or four year period in Cricket Four's life. To that extent, I think it was a great laboratory. It set very high standards. Sambit held a very high line. There was, I remember, the, uh, every writer in Cricket Four, newly arriving, had to go through two or three bruising encounters. In cricket, you went through with Courtney, uh, Courtney Walsh, or Kurtley Ambrose, or Shoaib uh, Akhtar. In cricket writing, you went through Stephen Lynch. <laughs> You wrote a piece, then suddenly there would come an email from England where he had taken, micro-analyzed your grammar, syntax, punctuation, sentence structure, uh, use of terminology, hyphens, uh, apostrophes. And there were so many red marks. It was the sort of lit literary criticism I never had when I was a student at university. Those bits were enormously exciting and being, you know, having pieces, writing them and having them come out on the website. Uh, they're all wonderful. But somewhere I think I realized cricket is not going to be my life. And if it is not going to be, then what is the point of committing to a very long period? It's merely an intermediate stage. And I think very early on, I was thinking of how to get moving. And perhaps the greatest, <laughs> you know, uh, Robert Bly says this, and it is true. Many things that are very dark in your life when you experience them, actually a certain kind of gift in, the, in, in retrospect. And I think the best thing that would have happened to me was my uh, very serious girlfriend at the time went to America to study and we broke up and uh, it was very upsetting for me. But freed of the need to earn a salary, to earn the respect of your partner's family, and I always felt that I needed a family like that, given my troubles with my own family. I had this emotional need for the security of somebody else's family. Freed of that need, I suddenly decided I can't bear to go to work anymore also. I want... I, I can't bear to face the world. And uh, that was bad. You are turning away from people in society because you can't take it. Uh, the good bit of that is you're turning away towards something productive, which is books again. And in, as I recall in my memoir in my country's literature, you know, books have always meant so many great things for me. So many spaces where, you know, it solved a problem in my life until one day it itself became a kind of problem. And it is something to think about as you go through life. But uh, so this was my journey. And then I thought, you know, at the very least, if I stay at home, I patch together a few book reviews, at least I'll have my control of my own life. And I gave up my job and uh, uh, said my goodbyes, including to our test matches. Who was the final score? I think 53-49 to you. We must play some other time. <laughs> no, I, th I, think in, I think in office office cricket, uh, you must have been ahead of me no, in terms no, of score. No, 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 no. But the most memorable dismissals would certainly have had me as a bowler. Correct, correct. So, You're right. <laughs> I'm I, kidding. I, I might have, the long-term trend might have been of my superiority, but there was a certain stage when I could not deal with that spin swing where I lost so many test matches that, you know, it was that I could never claw back the entire... Uh, again, it proves my theory that when you make progress, you must head on in fifth gear so that you, you know you can uh, um, um, have enough capital for leaner times yeah yeah i was i was totally like alan donald plus muthaya <laughs> <laughs> so how do you how do you deal with that but you you spoke about the role literature was playing in your life and i yes. want to read out another lovely passage by you um, where you write Having been formed by reading novels as much as the contours of my own biography and the conflicts of the psyche, I have in middle age come to see novels also as an unusual kind of wisdom literature, a place where a young person, acutely conscious of callowness and malformation, may be exposed to the nuances of human nature, social life, romantic love and history to the subtle workings of cause and effect. And also a sort of imaginative safe space where rage, violence, grief and trauma can be vicariously and cathartically experienced and one's own psychic wounds healed. I don't doubt that this was one of the main reasons for my attraction to novels in my youth. A novel can be a refuge for those who are thrown off by life, for the action of understanding what is going on in a text can serve as a sort of substitute for the challenges of action in the world. Stop quote. And you, of course, right, you know, this seems so dramatic. It's like you completely gave up the real world and shut yourself in a room and read books. But that's no. not at all hmm. what happened. No. You... I mean, when you read this, do you file it, uh, find it answers something about your own experience of reading novels or what they mean to you? Or you have a different relationship to novels, perhaps? No, it it does. I think that is sort of a role. And this will probably lead me to my next question before we get back to biography. But I find that that role of how does one of the shaping of the self. Mm. Uh, in this case, you uh, speak about uh, reading novels as the shaping of the self. And that's played a little bit in the sense that every time you read a novel, you are experiencing another life in another person's mm. head. And that yes. can give you much greater insight into your own blind spots and into the things that you do not see. But to a certain extent, more of that has happened from 
doing different i mean just from living in waste yeah. like one can't express but also from doing different things like i just think that doing five hour conversations mm. has yes. probably made me a better person because uh, i i now try to listen more i am mm. less judgmental mm. i am more interested in people's personal journeys as opposed to whether or not they agree with me and yes. all of that yes and i think those things also make a difference and i'll come to my next question with this because it's something that um you no doubt have a lot to say about which is that i have found that and i wrote an essay on this a while back also about how the form of something that you do can shape the content of what you're forced to do with it yes. and therefore shape you as a person like just see example like if, if instead of five hour interviews i was doing five minute interviews they would be extremely shallow yes. you know uh, and that would force a certain kind of work mm. and that would force a different kind of person mm. whereas over here i am forced to listen to reflect uh, to read much more deeply than i otherwise would not just to read one book by the author if you're talking about a book but read everything is written for example yes. which happens very often and i think that's so the form changed the work that i did and therefore that changed me and when i apply that to say what somebody like you would be doing mm. that when you would have started off mm. there would have been a particular form in which you were supposed to write book reviews like there would be a standard template of how a review is written say in a foreign newspaper when you write for an indian newspaper also there is a form that is at least at a very basic surface level dictated by the number of words that you yeah. have to play with but then you start blogging and all that goes out of the window and somebody else and maybe you should do this as well could might well have started talking about books on a youtube channel and that goes out of the window mm. because those forms don't then matter yes. you don't you don't have to you can just uh, approach a book in very different ways uh, look at different angles of it so do you feel that uh, you know being able to play around with different forms changed what you kind of came up with how you thought about books how you had to read them mm. no but uh, i would say that the deepest thread of my adult life is uh, the dialogue between reading novels the writing of them including uh, also encompassing the way i see people but uh, that long form bit you speak of and that structure actually is a structure that you create in your own life when you set out to write a book and it's going to be three or four years of my life i've i've only written one book in less than four years in my life of my three or four which is uh, days of my china dragon even those i wrote at many points uh, over a decade and uh, that continuous dialogue of creating a certain structure a tone a voice a life uh, a set of words uh, uh, an experience that flows in time is uh, the uh, in a way i think of writing a novel as an extremely good way to live because you a forever plowing a certain patch of earth and making it deeper learning the contours of the of the space and by the end of it you don't just write novels novels also write you back your characters write you back they create you as you as you create them it's it is a it is a continuous dialogue and so it's a very life transforming from novel to novel and thankfully in my life i've always embarked on projects which when i finished them i almost didn't recognize who i was either so much time had elapsed <laughs> or something had happened in the writing of it i became a better writer uh, no novel of mine resembles the other in terms of style so i now realize i have an ethic of writing making a new style for every book uh, the people i met or the things i had to answer in, to write those novels for instance the the exploration of tribal life and the history of indian democracy in clouds always took me into new parts of india which purely as a book reviewer as a person living in bombay i would never have gone and i was forced to find answers for questions i had in my head and answer them at length through people's accounts so it's a certain model of research a certain model of study a certain model of solitude a certain model of continuous practice a certain model of revision all being plotted on one on top of the other till the time when something comes out on the other side which is very in interesting to construct and you have full freedom and power to do it by yourself you know that no one is in a hurry to read you you have to like almost like a scientist work out what method works for you when do you write best in the day uh, can you get high for instance with coffee which is also something we discussed can you could, could you get high selectively at a certain moment in the day so that you are primed to write for 2 hours and that's all you need from then you can come down the rest of the day in a very nice slope and get ready again the next morning if you write every day are you a better writer than when you you write in large bursts in 2 or 3 months for me that works once i can string together 6 or 7 days i really find it much easier to write after 3 4 months it's the best place to be when you have 3 months of writing behind you you can write endlessly the rest of your life which is why sometimes i i tell myself you know the best time to start a novel is the day 
after you finish your previous one because you just know how to do it and once you let those 6 months 8 months 1 year elapse of waiting when you start out again you are actually a beginner you're nothing more than a beginner your experience is of no help is that internal rhythm and that sense of confidence in language that in the end you want and without that that's that's the way grounding as a personality that's why i feel although i might have been socially very inept and wouldn't know how to you know be in a relationship or be a very jealous or insecure boyfriend or a, a son who didn't understand some things or a very typical kind of man at the very least from these kinds of things i realized i need to apply this sort of method to life as well and there can be interesting results the things that you don't see which require some deeper understanding and that way you know novels are bottomless and that's what i really like about the great novels i mean you can read every page every line every chapter it's written with some sort of secret force that it's very hard to achieve long form in work uh, you know they're really really solid books so tell me a bit more about your uh, writing process but before that i'm also intrigued by this thing that you said that some of the application that you take to the act of writing hmm. can also help you in other ways in your life being a better son or boyfriend or whatever just yes you know um, i think the most difficult problem of being a human being separate from being a writer a human being body in in, in space and time is that uh, and it's a perfectly i have lots of empathy for people in making mistakes for this reason when you see two people arguing on a street even if you don't know them very well in a room you immediately feel like you can analyze the situation this person is making this mistake that person is making that mistake you cannot analyze yourself from outside of yourself because you cannot see yourself in that same way the person making the mistakes and the person analyzing the mistakes are coming from the same source and therefore there is not that third that's why i really love adam smith and his idea of the impartial spectator and the fact that you have to form a space somewhere within yourself to create a part of a personality that is able to watch yourself from above and analyze yourself so, so that you don't always end up coming to the conclusion that the other side is wrong because that's the most natural conclusion to have my point of view is better than yours they insulted me they didn't say this they also are you realize they also are thinking of you in exactly the same way as you're thinking of them but your investment in the situation means that you cannot see that and being blind to that no matter how much you try to do until you say what am i looking like to you am i coming what you say and how you come across are two very different things and as you grow older you realize you know that you are in control of how you come across but if i were to look at a video of myself 20 years ago i'm sure no such video exists i'm thankful for that i'd say what are you there's such a gap between what you're trying to do and what you're doing that you know it's not going to work out nobody is going to be impressed by your message they won't you, you, your rhetorical power is not is not to any great end and you are missing so much about yourself So in that way, the main thing here also, you know, is that you know, like, and this was very grateful not to have a job. You have endless hours, sometimes too many, to reflect on your mistakes and 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 on how you're living your life. And that spiritual aspect of reflection and meditation in in a writerly life, although it may or may not help the work, it makes you. I think it's good for for living. That it tells you that you know, on a daily basis, you have to think about how you come across, what you're doing, and you advance and you retreat. You advance and you retreat day after day after day. Uh, into books out of books into life out of life and your time that's why i really think for, as a young person you should try especially if you're a young woman in india today find a way to rent a space for yourself a house for yourself for a year or two and leave behind your last name as your identity be your first name and whatever you're growing into cook for yourself call people over make your own library and uh, reflect on who you are and where you're going and then go out into the world again that is a different kind of education very important So do you feel that helped you a lot like tell me a bit about that then just living alone cooking uh-huh. calling friends uh, I think who, the who... greatest day of my adult life was the day finally when I broke with the Indian uh, consensus that if you live in the same city as your parents you live in the same house as your parents which I reflexively always accepted until there was so much conflict over a particular relationship of mine I realized that you know the almost as a punishment I decided you know, I have to leave and find my own house I left home I landed up in Dadar I walked around a bit I went to a property dealer by evening you know this is a remarkable luck in Bombay by evening I knew the place where I wanted to live a small one room apartment in a very run down building at Century Bazaar junction two weeks later I packed up my things I still had the luxury of being able to go back to my mother's house but I packed up my things and left for this place within 3 days of my arriving there I went down to his restaurant and met one of the greatest influences in my life in my 20s like you were on my 30s the way you were in my 20s I met like the Amit Verma of my 30s <laughs> uh, Rupesh Pai this restaurant I used to uh, run an Udupi restaurant there and uh, set me off on a completely different journey 
and a couple of years later i i left for delhi but again i had a very nice house next door to my old friends and these two houses in my life uh, one in pravadevi for two years and one in kalkaji which i recently gave up nine years the longest i've ever lived anywhere uh, i think were the two real universities in my life because i learned i might have learned to be a writer and 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 uh, and i was a, a person in economy or son in all these places to be a complete human being i needed a house of my own which you know when you realize this you suddenly realize what space means as what space means in terms of personal power and of growing it as both as a space of interaction with people and as a space of private retreat a one room apartment is what you need to be a writer in some way where you can go back that's why so many writers are so attached to the studios and refuse to give it up and in that space i learned how to cook to invite people over to meet people on my own terms to go back and heal from wounds and traumas or breakups to just sleep all day long to stare at the people tree to um, uh, to go for a run to acquire memories and when i left that house you know it really felt like um, mm, leaving a person behind because um, how should i put it mm -hmm. all the memories of the people who pass there are part of your memory of that house and that one room and you know you will never in, in any house in the future sort of uh, uh, when will you have nine years in another room to acquire those they're just part of that juncture in your life and uh, it was a real training ground to be also to be an indian you know there's so many indians that we don't know that you almost have to create a little space where those indians can come together maybe some are still left out but one must make a bigger india than the one in which one grows up and if everyone does that in the end when we share our indias uh we construct something that we can't do by ourselves and in this way actually that one room was my education for so many things and what was your what was the process of writing your books like like i totally empathize with what you say about writing as a way of self discovery like john didion memorably said i don't know what i think until i write it down mm. and i discussed this with uh, <laughs> amitabh kumar also in the episode i did with him where mm. writing every day is such a good habit because you're deepening your sense of self you're deepening yourself i heard yourself. that and both of you had some very good thoughts on that yeah mm. i i was struck by that point yes. of his that writing shapes you and you know if if you are let's say you start in exactly the same space so let's say in alternate universes one version of you writes every day and one person of you doesn't write every day in 5 years i think you are different people yeah. so i i i get that so tell me a little bit about your writing process because it strikes me that when you're a journalist like when you're writing reviews or yeah. when i'm writing columns or whatever you're writing to a deadline you force yourself to do it um, you you kind of get the job done but when you're writing a novel it's a different kind of beast and what i particularly find hard in things that i try to do outside of you know deadline based things is that i find that discipline hard to come by mm. those pros like in my writing course for example out of the four webinars one is just about process yeah because i feel that that's where i learned the greatest lessons in my life by failing at it mm. uh, that it's not important to just have an intellectual understanding of writing and what you need to do and the craft and all that you actually need to kind of yes. sit down and write and force yourself yes yeah. how was it for you when you wrote your novels Well I think as children of the internet you and me both I mean that is the main the internet is a great resource in the life of a writer and almost the most destructive force as well So again like I was saying with something that has good and bad sides you have to learn to channel the good and uh, either turn off the bad the tap of the bad or also use that in some way uh between books for instance i get lazy and wake up in the morning check my email on my phone what's on on facebook likes uh, somebody's comments etc actually it's a bad thing to do but when i've written best in my life and even now when i write best is when i wake up in the morning i turn the internet off and i only look at email and everything else after lunch i have the morning till myself to read and write on in language that i control i don't even read the newspaper and i find suddenly you make a giant space of freedom it feels like a huge huge space in which you're just floating like a cloud across this giant sky and in the beginning it's a bit disorienting because one wants to turn away okay you you don't know what's your next sentence let's quickly check my email or whatever you've got to learn to train yourself to just live in that space and make it bigger and bigger you can you know like we are having very good coffee now you can break for a coffee keep returning back to your desk and learn to enjoy and own your own power over the written word and over language itself don't let anybody else's language in fact the place where it's almost like a temple where you are raising up something that hopefully is permanent and then you don't get distracted very easily either and avoiding distractions and being focused is i think the main thing and if you have the same in luckily i have you know i'm able to give the best of my days to writing the time when i'm the most awake my mornings i never want 
th- that to be taken away from me and that i think is the ultimate freedom for me in my life the when i wake up in the morning no one is in control of my day between 8 and lunch i can read i can write i can write in my notebook i can work up some ideas i can go for a little walk but i'm always inside the world of my book or whatever i'm writing the essay and i find you know when these 4 hours 4 hours 4 hours add up 25 26 days of the month um you cannot get to that place through any other means it only has to happen as a function of focus time and pleasure in that pleasure you know this is the paradoxical thing about human nature you can enjoy it so much but our sh- uh, addiction to short term pleasures is so powerful that even when you know that your long term pleasure is going to be very fulfilling you're continually pulled away and you have to keep on having to sort of like pull yourself back you have to learn this about human nature and sort of again push back against the easy wins of the day yeah i mean one concept i'm struck by is that every action you take now is an investment in your future self mm. so if i sit down to write i could say okay let me just play one game of online chess i'll play a game <laughs> of blitz and then i'll and then you play blitz for 2 hours <laughs> and your rating goes up but what you have done is you made your future self stupider because in mm. that un- unless you want to be a chess professional chess player because in that time you could have been writing or reading if that was part of an extended habit your future self would have been that much smarter but the opportunity cost of your playing online chess candy crush whatever the poison yes. might be is that you're hurting your future self uh another question is that one thing i find about novelists is that novelists are the kind of creators who are in a sense breaking what has become an important commandment of the creator economy as it were in the sense that you've you've quoted frank kermode uh, in mm-hmm. an essay writing about shakespeare mm-hmm. and uh, you've quoted him as saying about shakespeare there is a way of treating shakespeare as a very good but sometimes not so good poet as sometimes but not always clearly a writer of genius as always indeed a writer and to be considered as such stock quote and you yourself described shakespeare as possibly both majestic and fallible yes. right and it strikes me that one reason why shakespeare is all of this uh, these things is that he is privileging production over perfection yes it's that he's just writing 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 and good stuff comes out and the advice i always give to people and continue to give uh, is that have a bias for action you know yes. uh, where, wherever there is a trade off between getting it right and getting it done have a bias for getting it done because the only way to achieve excellence is through constant iteration so right 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 which is almost a mantra of the creator economy that just right 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 quantity even quantity is actually the way to quality in a sense and uh, that's something that works mm-hmm. in a lot of creative endeavor but it also seems to me at the same time like a writer who previously come on the show had said perfection is the enemy of production which mm-hmm. i totally get but at the same time when it comes to writing a novel it almost feels like you're locking yourself up for four years uh, or five years or whatever uh, and of course there are people like simenon who would write a novel in a week yeah. but otherwise you're locking yourself up for a long period of time and uh, you're following almost the opposite ethic yeah where you're working you know and like our mutual friend uh, sonia falero with whom we used to hang out so much in the yeah. good old bombay days she wrote i think four drafts of beautiful things yeah. four of and they're all different from yeah. each other which is incredible work ethic which i cannot imagine myself uh, do put i can't imagine myself putting myself through that but incredible work ethic so how does one think about this because as a reviewer I think one of the things that would have made you a good reviewer is that you're always writing reviews. There's a year when you mm. write seventy reviews. You do so much of it that you just become naturally better at it. But at the same time, when it comes to novel, it's almost as if it demands uh, the opposite approach. Yes, I very lightly agree. In fact, I mostly disagree with the idea that one should keep creating. You know, book reviews is part of the economy of literature. Some days to uh, they come out uh, on a, on a regular day of the week. Some days to write them. The discipline is important, so you cannot mess with that and say you can always all, you can always rewrite your book review as an essay um, at much greater length. But uh, it has to be done for a particular day. So so in that sense, that 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 ethic of production on time uh, in a reliable and predictable way applies. But uh, uh, the way to reconcile. one kind of thought and the other that one should privilege perfection is that actually you can keep writing lots and lots of words but why should they always be new words why can't they be the same words and that's when you get to the idea of a draft even the idea of an essay you know the reason why i really like writing essays is that, uh, like one in two weeks a 1200 word essay but having two weeks to write it you write a draft on monday if you had to send it by monday evening it would come out as a very 
I'm sure it would be decent to read. But when you write, rewrite it on Tuesday, then you rewrite it and again on Wednesday and Thursday, when you send it off on Friday, every word you have thought about a few times and you've moved the sentences around. At first, you said what you wanted to say. In the next draft, you began to polish a few arguments. On the third day, because you're thinking about it subconsciously, some minute qualifications of the points you were trying to make began to occur to you or a better version of what you're trying to say. You, you're not even working anymore. It's just now dropping down from the sky of your mind like raindrops. So you're staying with something for as long as it needs to produce the best version of what you can do. And that, I think, is a writerly ideal that is nice, you know, that you don't you don't produce at maximum capacity. It's not the Saudi Arabian oil barrels where, you know, like, you know, more writing is perhaps even in a material sense, more profit. Spiritually and with regard to your relationship with your work, it's not. And that, that way novels are very disciplining because what you're after is actually a language that you will never use again in your life. And to understand that language, to create it, to be, to be, to be shaped by what you already have done and to work the next year by, in the light of the insights you have got, you cannot do it on a time schedule. And what you actually want is that deep immersion where you will discover many things that you would never have known on the first day of writing. That's why, you know, so many novelists end up rewriting the first two, three chapters of their book because it's trash, not just because it's, it was the start of their work. They just didn't know what the chapters themselves led them to learn further down the line. So you rewrite your early work in the light of what you're able to do further down. And uh, once you do this and you realize what pleasure there is in it, you cannot return or you can only return under pressure for other reasons, you know, making money or etc. To In the end, you want to be left alone for that three or four, sometimes a bit faster, that experience of uh, uh, doing something which later when you read it, you won't realize how you could do it. You really can't really. I don't mean this in a sense of awe at, you know, like at creation. It's just that you got so involved with it. I cannot write Aziz Rauf again today, even if I know the story, because I cannot write like that. I could only write in that, at the time, in the light of what I knew. Those were good decisions I made then. And even the fact that I wasn't such a good writer, perhaps, or had real flaws and I could only write in certain ways, I could use my own constraints and limitations to create more deeply in certain spheres. You know, like you were saying, disciplines and constraints uh, can be a way of unlocking some things. In that sense, I think novels are good for writing. You know, um, uh, you completely abandon this idea. You descend from it from the very root that, you know, that, uh, you know, if I never wrote a novel in my life, I don't think that many readers in Indian literature, frankly, would miss me. I would miss myself and my uh, I would miss my writing. And... Um, and I know that there are many things that are waiting for me that I can only do by writing novels, including some understandings about how language works or how human beings work. So it's actually a way for me to go forward in my own life. And afterwards, of course, it's nice to be read. And I do want, I don't want to just write and not publish, but my readership is frankly not such a big, not a big deal in my life. And nor is my productivity level. Uh, it's something a little more private than that. I want to see a book that I can stand up on my shelf alongside the books that I admire and respect. It should be able to, like, uh, like Bibhuti Bhushan Bandhavadya's book standing next to my book should be able to, if they're, if they're able to talk to each other when I'm away traveling, I think that is, <laughs> if they don't look down on one another, I think that, that is a sort of thing that I, would give me pleasure. Where do you think they fall short now? My, my writing? Like, why can't your current books stand on the same bookshelf and have those they, conversations? They no, the, so in that sense, actually, uh, I mean, perhaps I'm o overestimating myself, but I don't feel they fall short. If they fall short, then I don't let them out. You know, I've reworked some books of mine endlessly. That's why Cloud took six or seven years to write. And I just was not pleased with what it was. And somebody would say, it looks fine enough. Let's bring it out. And I would say no. Until I can read it for pleasure myself. And f even be surprised by my own writing though I've done it myself. I can't let it go. And uh, that's the model I followed. And it has meant only three books in 15 years. But uh, they stand up on my shelf and I'm happy with them. Yeah, no, in my, in my question uh, earlier about, uh, you know, that production perfection dilemma, I, I actually agree with you. I mean, I think both models are fine. Yes. I, I, I think for a certain kind of creator, number one, you get to excellence by iterating constantly. So you got to just keep the production on. And number two, it takes a long time to build a sort of an organic following for your work. So if you are, for example, dependent on outside things like validation, you'll simply never produce enough. So you have to love what you're doing and then you have to just do it again and again and then eventually good things happen. But for a novel, I understand why the immersive experience is more useful where you kind of 
don't do uh, a quantitative analysis of you know john grisham once said that to be a successful writer you have to have the work ethic of an accountant <laughs> and i agree with him yes i yes. agree with him you do uh, uh, but at the same time not in the sense that someone in the creator economy might ki how many videos have i released mm. this week yes i get that and th- therein lies that other question of where does gratification lie because for a create like if you're making youtube videos or you're writing newsletter posts or you're even doing podcasts like this you have that sense that if i keep doing it again and again over a period of time organically growth will happen i have an episode out every week people yeah. will discover some episode or the other they'll binge on whatever came before and that's organically how growth happens for creators in all kinds of fields but for a novelist it must feel lonely that you write a book you bring it out and initially when you are young you think your first book <laughs> and all of that mm. and then you kind of realize that nobody really gives a fuck <laughs> the world is going on <laughs> you know the trains that you watch they are still going east to west west to east nothing has stopped right <laughs> yeah. then there is the question of what has this novel done I- is it then as much for this personal growth mm. and gratification or whatever is this something that kind of bothers you because when you write your book reviews and you really should start a newsletter because i think people like me especially would love to read something like that even if it's not formal essays or whatever but just your thoughts on books or for personal brief writing we'll talk about this after this episode i must convince you but uh, you know stuff like that has a sort of an immediate impact in the world which is measurable and is there and it's out there and you do it you put it out you move on to the next thing is it harder with a novel Mm. yes but uh, it is harder not because uh, and i think m- many novelists feel this it's not our fault that it's harder because the in the last 20 years the center of the cultural world has shifted dramatically away from lang- language towards the moving image uh, and towards other forms of storytelling including and there are very good examples of this what facebook uh posts and instagram messages which satisfies our need for story uh, as mario Vag- vagas losa very acutely put it uh, the human d- need for story is universal but the form in which we get our stories keeps changing and for 100 150 years novels held uh, for li- literate and educated people novels held the center and we grew up in that culture and that i'm no doubt that that's what influenced my desire to write right books like that one can accept that w- the world is changing so fast that you know you can like with so many other artisans you know you begin in a trade in 5 or 10 years you are in the marginal or have been moved to one side and you can either change to adapt and do something else in storytelling right for film etc etc or you can keep going thinking that you know uh, in my uh, i've always had a journalistic life where i write 30 40 pieces a year so that also makes me allows me to focus on other things and have the gratification of readership in different places the wall street journal or in indian newspaper mint wherever it is a travel magazine so it's all fine and uh, in the end the more you worry about the larger shape of the culture the more you become dependent i almost call it like the tyranny of the audience you know इन लोगों को ये चाहिए लोग आजकल ये कर रहे हैं देख रहे हैं इसीलिए मैं उस उस दिशा में जाऊंगा एंड इट्स ऑन द वन हैंड इज वेरी प्रेगमेटिक ऑन द अदर हैंड यू काइंड ऑफ फील यू नो इफ यू आर वेडेड टू एन आर्ट फॉर्म what is the chance that you will be able to start up in another thing you know there's some things that come from deep knowledge or things that have been part of your blood you're thinking for 25 30 years can you just make the jump perhaps you can but you'll be a lower grade of worker in another in a parallel art and somewhere i feel you know although in some other way i'm drifting away from novels myself i also want to write other kinds of non fiction books now in the end my heart and my even if i don't write novels i would still write non fiction books in a novelistic way and i might even say that uh, rather than write a weekly newsletter and get more readers i would prefer to give those 4 hours to a conversation of the kind that we are having now with someone i know or whom i want to know better and i would prefer to create and be created in tandem with human beings than to work at the level of books and of people reading yeah and you mentioned you mentioned the phrase tyranny of the audience but isn't that something that novelists have always kind of stayed away from like mm. i understand it might be the an imperative of a publisher or an yes. editor to try and shape your book in a particular way yes. but all successful novelists yes. in a sense yes. have kind of stayed away from the tyranny of the audience and done what the hell they want and led the way like if i see a problem in mainstream cinema today and i mm. think mainstreams of course are crumbling in every field yes. but if you look at mainstream cinema today the truth is the exciting work a lot of the exciting work is really 
uh, happening away from the big studios. Like I, I think mm-hmm. there's a lot yes. of rich world cinema happening today. Yes. But if you look at the big studios, it's just lack of imagination. It is oh, let us build a Marvel franchise and this franchise and that. And that's always been a problem of the mainstream. That what works yesterday, mm. they'll try to create something yes. like it tomorrow. Whereas the the end, the whole you know every good novelist will ignore what happened yesterday and just go yes. where they want to go. And if it works, it works and mm. so on and so forth. Uh, so, has the audience ever tyrannized you in that mental sense? Mm-hmm. No, uh, uh, of course. I think it's a bit upsetting for me that I uh, don't sell huge amounts of copies, and now you know I've got, gotten used to it. Uh, and uh, it's never tyrannized me, but I've realized that you know uh, the novel is marginal in India for many reasons. One that we are not historically a novel reading culture, so you know uh, anyway novels are minority pursuit in a culture even in the West and in India. Many people, you know, uh, the classic question at a dinner party in Bombay, Delhi, everywhere, somebody comes and asks you, "So what do you do?" Oh, okay, I write novels. Oh, you write novels, fiction or non-fiction? Yeah. A category mistake from the very beginning. You know, people. want stories but they don't make this conceptual difference in their a novel or a story you can write a novel about something that really happened to you you can write a, a, a book that you write about somebody else who's a real person could also somehow be a novel in their mind there isn't this conceptual partition and uh, it makes them a certain kind of reader but obviously it makes them blind to the fact that novels are a particular kind of literary artifact written with the greatest attention to story theme everything is under close control it's very carefully you know threaded out the way the episodes are structured so in the end i think you have to accept your fate you know you can't control your place in the larger and there's many accidents also you know you could write a novel about something that suddenly everybody is reading and that's lucky for some unlucky for others etc but uh, in the main i think you know i i i address this theme in an essay in this book the indian novel as an agent of history indian novels from the last 100 years you know were very very progressive in uh, many things that were not happening in indian society indian novelists of the time began to enact stories about gender revolutions political revolutions one step ahead of society because the novel gives you that room you can say things in a story that you can't do in real life but because pe- not a lot of people read them uh, the capacity of some great indian writers as thinkers as political thinkers except that they worked in the novel form when that nobody really knew what the gopinath mahanti said or uh, uh, bibhuti bhushan bandopadhyay's model of human relations adapted to the world of indian democracy or yashpal's idea of man and woman in the new indian republic you know all of these were thoughts that come out in novels like jhuta sach or pather panjali but they didn't have a huge traction and they don't have a common that's where i feel indian newspapers and novels have you know broken up <laughs> with each other so these ideas are not circulated and reviews are only about this character i like the the book is too slow etc etc there isn't that educated conversation about what novels bring in the realm of ideas through storytelling uh a story is also a particular way of releasing an idea and sometimes a much more realistic way of releasing an idea because you show it passing through the world of human beings in space and time it's not an abstract idea as a political theory so you cannot counter the biases of the culture at all these levels i sure i can write book reviews i can write novels in my novels there can be secrets but until a reader opens the book you know i go to give a talk at library sometimes every book is dead until the reader opens it and a certain kind of reader perhaps opens my book uh when i wrote days of my china dragon in the beginning nobody read it these days restauranters read it and write about it saying this really reminded me of my life behind the galla so you know you never know what destiny your book has many books become alive 20 or 25 years after they've been written so if you write enough books over 50 years in the end i think you've put in a solid shift and in the meantime you should live your life and uh, enjoy your afternoon naps drink your morning coffees you presented me with an amazing coffee this time one of the best i've had the, the, this month so uh, look turn away from these conflicts is my for now my you know like don't get too caught up in this in middle age you know live for other things i live for my friends my daughter uh, for football a very big part of my life for uh, for social encounters for travel mm, do, once you finish your day's work turn off the tap and forget all about it is my <laughs> is my thinking yeah you know, and, uh, like a true novelist you brought two contradictory thoughts together that of an afternoon nap and a morning cup of coffee <laughs> because now have you had you had this coffee how are you going to have a nap somehow i sleep very well after morning cups of coffee but if i drink coffee at 6 i can't sleep at night who knows what these mysteries who mean who knows what these mysteries are and i'm just kind of thinking aloud here that you know i so i did an episode with the publisher vk kartika a couple of years ago mm. episode i enjoyed a lot uh, episode 150 in fact i think it was the memory and yeah and uh, and one of the things she said was that people are not reading less people are pretty much reading as much as they ever were 
and i think that this whole notion of not enough people are reading is something that's been there in every generation and i think what happens is that there's a small percentage of people in every generation who read and mm. the same percentage is reading even today so that yes. is not lost except that the rest of the people are also expressing themselves all over the place so you imagine that oh more people are not actually reading books mm. but uh, the number of readers is pretty much the same and therefore and in an indian context it could be said that uh, you know like in an essay sara rai wrote about her grandfather premchand she mentioned how he went to some random event somewhere where he was it was not a book event he just i forget the exact this thing but crowds had piled up to see him mm. you know especially in the languages yes. people still care deeply yes. about reading and yes. the whole culture is still there so you know even if it's always a small minority of people who read it's mm. kind of always been like that so maybe that culture is there but you could also be right that um, english writing in india may not have an organic audience like that yes and that audience itself may be drifting more towards non fiction now than novels for the sense so there can always be these micro trends under the broad trend when somebody says not enough people are reading i take this that in translation as meaning not enough people are reading the sort of books that i think that should be read which can be real on or, or, or has both an element of genuine has a substantive element to it plus a kind of bias as well so since I and to also a great extent, looking on your library, I know you like rate novels so highly. We kind of feel okay, but these are such beautiful, amazing books. Why don't more people read that rather than reading the latest? You know, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I think we read more than we used to. On your phone, you can read in a five-minute space while waiting for the train. You can read two, three articles. Where did you do that before? So we probably consume a lot more words. But the best kind of words, the sentences that are written to be remembered. You know, that level of writing. that requires real focus and dedication to to make the journey all the way there it can't be something that randomly floats across your brain you want that encounter that well who knows we'll find out i think jonathan hait once made the great point that uh, even though we have all of literature and everything available to us at a keystroke which you know when you and i were growing up we did yes. but even though we have all of that available at a keystroke now most people today are reading something that was produced in the last 3 days yes so it's very fleeting it's temporary and uh, often it is short catering to the yeah. sort of the short attention span uh, but i guess people who want to read sometimes even they can't even act on the impulses if they want to read because the, 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 yeah. their brains been colonized yes. by this constant need for dopamine that yes. social media gives you and uh all of this gives hmm. you but uh, in the end let's not yeah like um, perhaps there's some unfortunate aspects of this but let's not still forget that there's hundreds of thousands of very sophisticated readers out there in india they might not all read the same books but when you line them up and line their libraries up it's a fantastic world tell me something else so yeah, last year i was on the jury of this literature prize uh the jcb literature prize and reading through the vast number of books that we get th- uh, went through you know all of us realized that the quality of entries that were coming in were incredibly low mm. we managed to get a good long list out i'm yeah. i'm happy with all the books in the long list and the short list is great books a privilege to be able to read them as part of work but the quality was incredibly low and in some cases you wondered that what are these publishing houses doing all the big name publishing houses came out with books which screamed no editor no editor yes you know so what's the scene here is is that first of all like was it an outlier year or perhaps is my judgment um, uh, you know somehow wrong in this mm-hmm. because however much i read i, I read selectively i read yes. books i want to read books i have heard about so i am in a sense reading the cream of the crop already just mm. just by selection bias to start with but mm. how 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 rich mm-hmm. is our ecosystem so to say It's rich. It's just rich. Uh, 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 I think, as from the combined perspective of a former book reviewer, still current in some way, perhaps a lesser intensity, and a novelist, I would say, um, from my point of view, the average Indian novel, especially in English, is incredibly banal. The v- very good Indian novel is very, very good. and so there's a it's not a, 
a ladder with like the rungs you know there's there's huge gaps between them and uh, so in the end you end up with lots of mediocre material and out of that um, some really wonderful books and if you can imagine any literary culture if you can find 10 novels in the year that are really worth reading you know the standard for good novel is so high that in the end as i've written in many reviews of mine most novels are bound to fail by the highest standards no matter how hard you work how much time you put in it doesn't quite cut it at the level of you know the, the think of a great great novel brilliance of language intensity of character depth of understanding of human nature ability to realize narrative effects to construct to keep and the, the tempo going you know to uh, present reverse Uh, to change point of view it's not a small toolbox to have you know as an uh, so in the end many novelists end up with two or three strengths that they kind of play to and the rest they try and cover up or, or move away from uh, you can also see people's weaknesses as you read and uh, that's why they write you know so a lot of indian uh, novels tend to be monologic rather than dialogic the characters don't talk a lot to one another the narrator explains lots of things about them and judges them in all sorts of ways and makes inter- interpretations about what sort of so- society they are the satirical novel or the ironical novel in the end i feel very impatient with many of these forms because in the end the writer is so much more powerful than the characters i feel they're not respecting the characters enough that depths to your own characters which you're not picking out because they're so keen to explain who they are um uh, i prefer lighter ha- lighter touch on on novelistic uh, material uh, where there's some mysteries which you also throw up your hands and say like i'm not going to explain this Uh, this is just how people are. This is how the the reader must make up their minds. Uh, so in the end, you come up, any judge you would come up with these ideas, and maybe there would be. I have my biases. Everybody else would, but I think your experience is broadly true, and there's nothing too disturbing or disconcerting about it. If you can produce ten good novels a year from across the languages. Um, Uh, I'm only perhaps a little worried that in the end it doesn't seem to do a huge amount even for the sales of these books. Somehow there's the gap between the prize and the readership still remains. Perhaps the prize-winning book might still have a lot more readers, but uh, there is a gap of interpretation explanation where there's not a middle space where novels appear in the public world of Indian culture. Like I said, again, the book review and the newspaper is the place where if somebody on the op-ed page of a newspaper debated a novelist's vision of India, that would be a place where the novel has escaped its normal categories to enter the mainstream. For some reason, even newspaper editors are very not at all keen to put books on any place. Even books pages now become more about interviews with writers than a consideration. of the so you know uh, how can you in such a space present the deepest meanings that a very deep form can it's become a, a cult of the cognoscenti and the connoisseur those who really love it can talk about it day and night but you can't find any trace of it it's like a ghost ghost in the culture <laughs> <laughs> no and i think there's also a chicken and egg here yes. that uh, an editor of a newspaper might well say that hey i can give three books pages but there aren't enough good writers mm, at that level is, yes, yes. and the other pop- part of it is that if you don't have those pages to begin with there can never be good writers yes. at that level Agreed. because where's the ecosystem so that's where i feel the certain newspapers and certain media houses have uh, destroyed some aspects of indian culture uh, and uh, i almost feel when i come back to bombay now i don't live here i meet some people who actually i wouldn't call them anything else uh, they are a times of india mind their main preoccupations are cricket politics bollywood and the stock market and for them there's nothing greater to art than that and what works in the market is what is art is and on classical music on indian painting there will be almost nothing to say they don't even think these are legitimate points of view unless you are making money from it when it does become legitimate yeah and i guess my earlier lament actually just falls into place with sturgeon's law which is sturgeon's law is 98% of everything is scrap <laughs> so that yes. applies to everything including books except that i was forced to read uh, Uh, um just to interrupt in those 10 books that you would have picked you would have found a great internal diversity of thought tone manner and that i think that diversity in indian novels is really yeah. something to you realize there's so much granular detail that these people are picking up which when it gets into your mind you see the world differently from then on yeah absolutely i mean uh, so some of it is stunning a couple of the really good books on the shortlist uh, which uh, didn't happen to win because it was a good shortlist were actually rejected by many publishers mm. before they got published yeah and i was i was kind of um, shocked by that because mm. given the uh, kind of crap they publish otherwise to think that two such good books would mm. not just even be the sales or marketing team would have said we can't sell this so that that was per- perhaps the main reason why you know a lot of mediocre novels can still push 2000 copies of this in the end it's a purely in some way an economic you know you can't blame the publisher they are putting capital into it you can't blame them but you can't forgive them either yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I think I think what I find in all other fields is that because the mainstream is dying, because mm. it's getting dispersed, that yes. artists no longer need to rely on these platforms or these intermediaries to reach their audiences. But that is not the case with novels, it's and not. I wonder how it could possibly be the case with uh, uh, novels, even. You know, because with every other form, there is a constant dialogue happening between creators and audiences, and they're discovering their niches, and mm-hmm. it's a process that takes a lot of time. But a novel almost seems like, uh, you mm-hmm. know, as uh, quaint as a test match. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> such a difficult and for personality, personality, it won't even do the things that will help itself to grow in the world. So let's kind of get back to the <laughs> chronological journey uh, of uh, your life as a reviewer. Uh, mm-hmm. But before that, question about how did this dialogue between writing novels and reviewing them how did these influence each other like i would imagine that if you, once you once you have reviewed many many books mm. you read them in a different way with a yeah. different kind of attention to craft and detail and that can influence the way you write yes and at the same time when you write you might then be aware of certain aspects of actually what practitioners go through which you might have missed as a reviewer had you not written yourself yes i think book reviews are a great training in uh, becoming a writer because uh, as i said if you're really going to take it seriously you end up copying out a lot of sentences to for use later uh, and to p- select as a little garden of sentences from the book and when you copy out sentences i always tell my writing students the eye works so much faster than the hand that when you read a sentence you might notice some things about it when you write it out so much more slowly you suddenly realize if you aren't looking at that page as you're copying it out you put a comma in the wrong place or you you miss out a couple of words you realize actually there's an architecture of the sentence and a construction that is not immediately perceptible that you only work out when you write it out again and that is very good training because then you are writing making somebody else's sentences your own and also learning things about rhythm pacing pausing uh what kinds of information to put ahead and before how to load up a paragraph uh, an opening sentence a closing sentence uh, all these things become really palpable to you and when you do that then uh, it doesn't mean that you inst- in- instantly become a better writer but you become a better reader of your own writing and uh, once you can become a better reader of your own writing it means that you're willing to work harder at it to make it even a touch better somebody else will say this is perfectly publishable he said no 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 this uh, this i can't work out now but give me a couple of days i'll solve this problem and bring it back to you and then you are really like you know uh, what i really love about the world you know these biographies of the indian classical musicians of old those who never made any money lived in poverty all their life you would still go to their house and they are still working on some you know thing for 3 hours every day because that's just their life as it is in there and i think an artist must also be a craftsman of that kind you know other people may not notice you have to have a private ideal perfection if it doesn't sound exactly right keep on tinkering away till it pleases you when you hear that sweet sound you'll know oh now i can have my dinner or i can have my nap this was worth working for and that way it's a good dialogue between you know writing is so so big it's an incredible thing about books every writer uses the same language if you're writing in english the same resources the same dictionary the same vocabulary the same stock of words but no writer sounds like one each other even when you try to copy somebody you end up sounding a bit like yourself and perhaps a bit like them as well you in the end writing doesn't lie you reveal who you are and actually your work is to put more and more of your real self into your, you you construct a writing self at the beginning so you write from a narrower bit of yourself the older you grow i find as a writer the more and more you can put who you are transpose yourself onto the page and write with a full sense of your force all the muscles of your soul you put on, put 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 into a sentence and then it's pleasurable then sometimes it means you can write too fast because you're so confident of what you're doing you still have to stop yourself from getting tricked by your own confidence but uh, all these aspects of uh, creativity and craftsmanship i think um, even in words are uh, they have make life worth living yeah and and this mindfulness to d- detail this attention I, like i'm reminded of the, like one of my favorite short stories is alice munro's a bear came over the mountain mm. uh, which first came in the new yorker and i remember once looking at the version in the new yorker and the version uh, that came out in the book oh. that she did mm. and they are almost identical except for a punctuation mark in the last <laughs> paragraph mm. and you realize and i don't remember whether it was a comma or what it was but reading those two versions i suddenly realized that yeah man the <laughs> whoever the new yorker editor was he kind of screwed it up yeah. she meant it this way right yes. and it's just such have you read the story 
I haven't read the story, but I can completely understand what you're saying down to the very magazine because one of the problems of the very famous magazines is the editors take over your style to align it with the magazine style. A great crime, I find, in writing. And one of the one of my problems with reading fiction, The New Yorker, the stories read not too much like each other, not in the sense of the material, but in the sense of the way they are written. Uh, and uh, therefore, Alice Munro like totally has my thumbs up for taking this out. This vicious comma that you know takes you away from your own writing, and it's such a minor thing. I don't think anyone except someone as anal as me would notice well this. Well spotted. No, it's not anal. It's it's dedication and love of literature in the sense that uh, any small thing in in, in lit- you know what is the difference between words in language in life and words in literature? In, in literature, ideally, you want every word to be meant and to be intended and to be in control of things. So every single mark in literature is also meant. So if it can be unmeant or better meant, that should also be part of your work. So on this note, let me bring up this email exchange that you reproduced in your book <laughs> that you had with Robert McCrum, who was a famous books editor at the yeah, Guardian, right? Yes. Uh, and up. yeah, and you sent him an email first, and the subject is modestly uh, because he had messed with the word uh, the word modestly, and and your email goes, "Hi Robert, modestly. The whole point of the piece, I think, was that the book was modestly good. With that word cut out of the last sentence." It felt as if I'd overpraised it. So basically, you'd said the book was modestly good, and he cut, as this book was good. The, the, this book was good, and uh, you were complaining that it felt like I overpraised it. Uh, Mr. McCrum's reply to you was, "Quote: No, with the word cut out, you made your point well, and not too pompously. As published, it was a good review. Thank you. Stop quote." <laughs> And I I want to kind of dial down a little bit on that pompously bit, yeah. right? Because what a book reviewer is essentially doing yes. is standing in judgment, yeah. standing in judgment over a book, a writer, yes. an endeavor, and so on and so forth. And you you know, with a greater amount of self reflection than I had back in the day. Today, I'd feel a little. Um, I'd I'd be very wary of that, hmm. of taking it too far. Yes. Of um, of the pompousness, as it were. Yes. <laughs> Is that a challenge that you have faced? Like when you look back on your younger self, hmm. do you sometimes think that there was too much certainty sometimes hmm. that um, uh, you was, you know, that hmm. you might have gone overboard somewhere. Hmm. Well, I'm trying to analyze myself, and you know, I could have a, like a, a positive bias towards my past. Even in this one instance, I put it on as a both as a sense of the comedy of the the you know the correspondence of book reviewing, which nobody ever writes about, which is fun to read. You know that you can debate a single word, but also about you know this whole thing that you know every single word matters, and you can have a discussion about that. But finally, I would even say what in. What he would think of as pompously, I would reinterpret as passionately. You're too passionate sometimes. You're so caught up with the book that you feel like when it's very good, you overpraise it, and when it's uh, you don't like it, you almost find uh, you're too strong in your judgment. But actually, what it speaks to deep down is a real love of uh, you think that books are so important that not they should not be taken lightly at all. It doesn't matter whether it's modestly good or good. It does matter is how you think to yourself. And obviously, when you take that opinion out, an older person will gently put you in your place. I thought. It was was quite graceful the way he did it. Uh, he wasn't exactly saying that you are being pompous. Only that that word perhaps was, or or he, he might even have been saying. You know, Englishmen really love to. Uh, one of the things about English prose is often, you know, many things are left unsaid. He might even have been saying you are not being pompous, but it comes across as being so. Therefore, I'm helping you by taking out the one word in there that actually makes understates your case for yourself. I'm leaving the best of you on the page. There could be all these. I've never, you know, uh, I'm sort of uh, uh, riffing now, but uh, uh, it was a good exchange, and uh, I, I was so grateful for these unknown. Once in a while, I was to work out the money to go to England, and actually, in uh, books, editor is so important in your life as a source of work. You almost feel you have to make a courtesy call, just say, "India, me, I'm like Diwali, me, karte hain, take a box of sweets." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Take something to show your face that they remember. Later, when the book comes in, he should remember you or she. And uh, I'm so grateful for these people, you know, because without those little bits of help from here, the the pleasure of seeing my work out, and you know, I I could be very poor, earning twelve fifteen thousand a month, but I know I'm being published in three continents in the world. Chalo, no problem. This is sweet enough for life in literature. And uh, really, you know, I feel very grateful to these folk who God knows, you know. Hundreds of people must have been writing to them. So many reviews coming. In. Imagine the life of a book review editor. In in the nineteen nineties, there used to be this magazine. Lasted for a lot longer, but I wrote for them in the nineteen nineties called Rock Street Journal. Yes, I am in fact the only writer in the world to have written both for the Wall Street Journal and the Rock Street <laughs> Journal. So a signal achievement. So I remember at one point there was somewhere in the mid nineties there was a Prince album which had come out. I think it might have been Emancipation. 
the yes. it was a big album triple album or whatever and i loved it so i wrote a five star review and i went into it in great detail and yeah. the, then there was uh, the the magazine had the custom of giving a star rating so i gave yes. it five yeah and when they published it they <laughs> published my review exactly as it was but they put three stars instead of five <laughs> and i was like this makes no sense because my words are going one way you're going the other way yes and uh, the editor at the time uh, uh, the late amit sagal fantastic guy uh, mm-hmm. sadly died in a boating accident i think uh, he said no no we just felt that five is too much for an <laughs> album like this and i'm like no I'm, <laughs> you know uh, so let, let's mm. let's come to sort of another interesting aspect because what is happening is on the one hand you have started freelancing for foreign uh, newspapers as you're writing reviews yes. they are paying 150 $180 $300 dollars princely yeah. sums of money for young yes. people like us at that time and on the other hand you also got uh, this gig at uh, mint yes. when uh, you know mint started they had books pages uh, yes. and um, priya ramani was an excellent um, editor yes. there and she gave you a gig but you were getting only 15k a month for writing weekly reviews so you listen were, it was a, it was a lot of money Uh, mm. were, uh, perhaps not in an objective sense, but relative to payment at the time, it was a lot of money for several reasons. One, since you only got paid in India fifteen hundred, two thousand to begin with, was already an upgrade on that something double of that per piece. So people would actually give you fifteen hundred, two thousand yes. per piece. Yes, yes, and mm. even now that's what you get for many Indian newspapers. Yeah, uh, those rates have not uh, gone up, uh, and uh, two, it was secure income because you knew that would be fifteen thousand every month. Uh, so at least you knew that you know. you could count on it and three it went uh, work every week so you didn't have to hustle all the time keeping on writing to folks so you saved on some labor and four i felt at the time that uh, some readers would notice you every week and begin to f- like what you would do with your blog you know fall in tune with the idea that there's a consistent sensibility interpreting all manner of books from biography to uh, religion to and also it was an intellectual exercise for me so in all these ways that was the wealth creation of that you know i think life is about learning finally to see both learning how to make wealth and also learning how to see wealth in many things which are not conventionally thought of as meaning rich riches and in this way as some of i've always had a kind of sixth sense that this could be very productive for me and three or four years of reviewing books every week was like my education not in literature but in indian literature and i really enjoy the chance to read indian novels indian economists indian biographers indian writers in politics and it was fantastic and when it was well done these people later would write to me and would become friends i would go meet them in different parts there was a window to the i never strategized it that way but we became we like a conversation was set up as a good book review can always do in the readers mind as well a conversation with, between the book and the other books you've read in the past and in all these ways it was fantastic and uh, again you know the like, um, uh, like i say you know, i could go to the mint office in dadar uh every week and not only get the book that i was supposed to review for the book, week but all the other books that were not going to get reviewed and would go to the raddi i would say okay shall i take these and priya and sanjita would say chalo it's, it's a space cleared off my table i'd come back with 10 15 i felt so rich in my shoulder bag full of stuff that has just come out that i wanted to pay for so it was worth it in so many ways and uh, you know I, i when you are young I, it's almost a mistake to make too much money also it makes you too dependent on the things that money can bring for you the restaurants the bars the goods the um, iphones so whatever so, um, i have some of these now but i didn't then and i think in the end it was probably good for me yeah and there's a there's a notable passage again from your book which i'll read out which is about exactly this where you write these small sums erratically forthcoming did very little for my worldly prospects including my romantic ones mm-hmm. had they constituted my salary at a newspaper or magazine i would have been greatly despondent and resentful but being the pearls of self employment they were worth much more than could be calculated by a narrowly economistic measure they underwrote my freedom and independence my sense of self worth and vision my mornings wandering around on buses and trains my afternoon naps they protected me as much from indulgence in bars and restaurants and other sites of conspicuous consumption as they did from the horror the deepest most dispiriting note of my life for the two years that i worked <laughs> for a cricket magazine of being a drudge in an office a servant of clock and contract and they allowed me to sleep soundly at night often after a long stint of reading and to wake up late in the morning surely that was as much as one could reasonably ask from a trade and wage between the age of 25 to 30 when most young people seek to rise swiftly in worldly post and station i never submitted my cv anywhere making almost a fetish of my independence i rarely left bombay i lived as frugally as possible 
stop quote and you know that that conservative note that you strike here that i was protected from indulgence by my penury <laughs> all <laughs> couldn't have put it better in five or seven words yes almost seems to me like some kind of rationalization like even if you didn't go to a bar with the money it would have been nice to have at money i, I couldn't have met that money though that's the whole thing i, I couldn't have, yeah so and i must also say i cheated a little bit because every now and then i have to drop by at your house or sonia's house and you have un- like i said that that essay might not have actually been written but it can be written in two sentences the drinking companion of my 20 is just put amit varma sonia phalero and leave the end on that note uh, so um, i i did enjoy myself a lot too yeah i'm i'm not even much of a drinker but i guess a drinking companion doesn't have to drink it huh. just has to be a companion <laughs> while you drink so <laughs> right. yes so this comes to mind in the context of and again i'm conflicted about this yes. that there is this piece of advice that you believe in when you're young and mm-hmm. which is often given to young people that follow your passions do yeah. not compromise but then i look around and as i grow older i look around mm. me and i find that most of the people who actually did this in their 20s and 30s a oh, fuck now mm. they haven't got in anywhere the cafes of versova are filled with yeah. strugglers who didn't make it and they are filled with resentment for all their peers who have who did their mbas or whatever <laughs> have fancy yeah. jobs fancy houses fancy cars and they are kind of screwed and they are kind of nowhere so i i i get both sides of that of why uh you know to live yes. a fulfilling life you need to live your live a fulfilling life doing something you love that you wake up every morning and you look forward to doing but at the same time uh you know the money is also a factor in all of that like at some point and i have noted this down but i can't find it in my notes you have a wonderful sentence about how uh you know once you decided not to care about money uh, and become a uh, give your life to books money suddenly became the most important thing because you have to put the next meal on the table or whatever yes i think i would i should write to book review editors in order of highest payment to lowest payment not in order of readership or <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that was my hierarchy yes you know you know you're right and um, uh, also sometimes you realize your passion and your ability can sometimes especially when you're young you cannot read yourself so well you may think that you'll going to be the greatest writer singer ever you find two or three years later that you know life has taught you some cruel lessons about where you actually stand and uh, no money is important and it also like i said gives you self respect uh, agency freedom power in the world yeah i think if one should be idealistic though one should do it in one's 20s because you can take most risks then with yourself and your personality can suffer the blows of rejection and uh, and uh, uh repression uh and you can bounce off that and then just move into some other place it's harder when you're older and uh, then you also have to have the discipline also you know to not become bitter as you grow older because everybody feels to a man that even those who are very successful feel that we went as successful as we should have been if somebody praises and we know this culture in india today they praise me but they don't praise me for the things that i really should be praised for <laughs> so you know that you can there's never any end to that road you got to learn to make your peace with life and find pleasure and uh, mm, uh, and fulfillment in so many other bits of life you know i think the art of writing novels is also the art of saying novels are not the most important thing in life they can be very important for you but beyond that people and uh, life is more important even novels tell you that <laughs> even novels tell you that tell me about sort of the media landscape in india when it comes to being open to the kind of not just in terms of books pages but even cultural writing and so on because you know in the early 90s it seemed like there might be hope and i think we uh, know vinod mehta started indian yeah. post and independent and they yeah. had their books pages and uh, uh, there was some action there yes. and so on and so forth and um, even at the time lounge started when mint began mm-hmm. and they started lounge and there was a lot of that cultural coverage but after that you know one doesn't see it these days and of course i don't see it these days because mm. i don't even get any physical newspapers yes. but it's just not there and you were the uh, you were a books editor at caravan for a while where yes. you were commissioning short stories yes. uh, poetry not commissioning in a but publishing Reading, yes. short stories and poetry and all of that and trying to i, I suppose bring about and build an ecosystem bring about a culture of stuff and all of that what was that experience like and how has your thinking evolved and do you think that that the media somehow made a mistake there because what the media will often do is that you will try to go as broad as possible and not deep enough into any one thing yes. but that is a mistake yes. because the point is that if you go deep in a few places there are all these niches which in a country like india even a new niche can be big in absolute numbers yes. 
which can be worthwhile to pursue for their for its own sake not everything need be homogenized so what's your sense of yes. indian media there do you think there's an opportunity lost do you think even today something yes. like that could do well big time a big time opportunity lost because uh, you know in the end this is the whole thing about competition do you compete by trying to become like something else or do you compete by pr- finding a better path for yourself and especially you know when you you just if you and i were to take a walk down the street today or just go to andheri and take a train to uh, churchgate and come back in the evening by randomly taking trains and buses stopping at bars cafes the immense range of language and thought we would hear just in a single day would make you think if if you had we should never read a newspaper in your life you'd say from tomorrow let's start a newspaper presenting all possible points of view where you know both the politician and the person you randomly the you know that that way some instagram handles are really wonderful humans of bombay etc etc anybody's language and perspective on life can be so great when you find it in a structured space and why couldn't you present a front page story not about uh, the latest revelation about the economy or whatever but just transcribing a union leader speech uh, in a protest march uh, uh, word for word they read the speech on the page and that is your top with a nice photograph or whatever so you get a sense of the clash of voices in your society there's so many so many things you could do with a newspaper in there and of, of course daily journalism is also a big grind and you have to there's so many other imperatives not having been in the business i would hesitate to criticize uh, because it i would not understand some of the constraints especially the financial ones which are huge but in the end you could say that those in charge really are not classic newsmen or women of the old school who love a well written well produced deep newspaper as an intellectual artifact you know it can't perhaps be a, as a, the same quality as a book but it's a solid read from page to page that when you finish it you could say here's a a thing that puts other people in in touch with society in a way that they couldn't without the newspaper of which newspaper could you say that in india today in english perhaps to a little extent the telegraph i think it is quite well written some bits of it are but in the end it's all finally lowest common denominator mostly run by like culture is always bollywood film stars or a books that film stars write or news or writers that film stars endorse you know it's a, the, the path of lowest resistance and immediately you think is that what an education is for you know the idea is like surely we have greater resources than this to but in spaces like the caravan they became very niche then although it's written to even to the state i think is the best magazine to read in on a monthly basis you know that that deep dive into profiles into long form stories is fantastic and i feel really really proud of having worked for a little while all the right on the edge and they've shut down that section itself a sign of how difficult it is to keep it keep something like that going but for a while it was a great project to be a part of and I have the highest respect for the people I worked for many young writers in their late 20s fresh from journalism degrees came in learned their ropes and now working elsewhere uh, as a training school as a theater for different kinds of india it was you know those profiles of indian politicians in the caravan arun jetli modi uh, you can still read them today as literature they deserve to be put together in a book like the caravan book of profiles or whatever and to that's the model of journalism i subscribe to as my you know my motto my, like for for journalism like that i'm willing to even give up my books and work every month every week to like be part of an ensemble if something like that could be put together i would be very happy to join it and uh, because being part of a team and working for a project bigger than yourself in the end there's few satisfactions in life that are bigger than that but if it can't be done then you retreat into your private space and make little <laughs> uh, interventions here and there uh, working across media but i would definitely say you know where is the great indian newspaper today we are a great nation we are a nation moving towards greatness our stories are completely off the charts in terms of rapture rigor the new boundaries being broken there's not a space that records it all or that where you can you can patch it together from looking at instagram videos youtube channels uh, meeting folk but uh, it would be great if it was in print yeah i agree and even caravan has declined a lot uh, mm-hmm. in in uh, sort mm. of recent times but i completely get that sentiment you know we live in interesting times and i wonder if this affects the way people view art as well yes. like for example everything today in our discourse is really about narrative battles right yes. and history has of course been weaponized to that service yes. but one thing that i find uh, distressing and that's it's always of course been the case that um, a lens of politics has sometimes been thrown upon to, to to towards art towards literature cinema to evaluate that but i find that happening more and more 
today now the 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 broader like where yeah. art is looked upon almost as something functional the way kashmir files is being praised yes. for example and has become mm. a part of you know what is a pitched political battle yeah. where people aren't talking about you know looking at looking at the film just for its own merits but there is just so much baggage yeah. that the film carries while my sense has always been is that art and politics should just be separate not just in the sense that you don't look at art through the prism of politics but that uh, the artist uh, should keep his politics out of his art to a fair uh, extent and uh, you know as as i think uh, you know kundera once wrote in an essay that you know then you run the risk of art becoming propaganda as it were <laughs> what what's your sense of, uh, what's your sense of this yes there i don't agree because uh, you do run the risk of it becoming propaganda but that's it you run the risk it doesn't mean that it automatically lands up there and also you cannot divorce your politics from your art uh, you know uh, it depends at what level do you like uh, translate your politics into your art i is your uh, in some indian writers i can see who also write in non fiction and when they write novels their novelistic writing voice is basically a transposition of their yeah. non-fiction writing voice into the narrator of the books it's so dull because there could be something interesting in the story but in the end the controlling figure is just the same from above so it's uh, it's not enough of a jump but uh, if for instance you believe as you know that uh, uh, indian society is very in- interesting because of the mix of voices and that india deserves to be democratized more and more every generation must carry the work of deepening democracy at some level no matter what work you do you must you must throw new voices into it that is your politics at some level if then your art emerges from there where is it where is the problem i don't see any problem like that there can also be a way of both of expressing and of limiting your politics when you know what politics can do for art that's the responsibility of the artist not to take it too far but also that is the a motivating force that makes you believe in human beings or that makes you angry saying these people haven't got the due so i'm all for politics and art but uh, not in that sense of uh, characters also becoming mouthpieces for opinions like i said i wrote an essay in a novel i want in novels to actually dramatize the conflict between two points of view rather than state my own my truth can remain my truth but not on the pages of my fiction because there that's the space for a different kind of encounter it must be questioned by the opposite of whatever you're trying to say and then that encounter becomes interesting for readers in clouds i think what have done well and I, li- i like reading it it's a conflict of opinions between two brahmanical old people and one young person who believes in the religion of clouds and they both don't understand each other in chapter 1 and by the end they somewhat understand each other at least they ask each, each other some questions that for me was very very interesting to do it's clear that the writer thinks very harshly of the older people as some people are very very close but as the book progresses you get to like them more and more because in the end this is also something very unique about human beings they can be really terrible but you spend a lot of time with them you find things that you like about them and in the end we can put aside our differences and make cause on so many spheres with human beings with whom we have been in conflict in our life politically socially familiarly in the end you kind of think you know we must focus on these bits about especially in our in our in our dark darkish <laughs> darkish time we have to construct and uh, uh, align and link up in whatever way we can yeah i agree with all of that i mean uh, but, you know our politics is baked into who we are and who we are is baked into what we write yes. but as long as it's about people and as mm. long as it's not too overt and whatever it's fine i am mm. uh, you know so i was i was kind of going through the middle stage Yes. and you have a section on the right about popular uh, pieces and one of the ones uh, linked there was uh, actually i think got you told a lot also was your <laughs> review of rang de basanti where i'll read out this uh, b- i'll read out these bits from it because i really enjoyed it and i will somehow make it lead to a question because okay. otherwise uh, what could justify my reading them out mm. uh, uh, quote <laughs> amir khan's latest foray into indian history is without question a cinematic venture of remarkable daring it left me completely stunned In almost two decades of watching Bollywood productions I have never come come across such preposterous drivel as that served up in the second half of this film. Mm-hmm. One reason for this of course is that Rangde Basanti takes itself so seriously. And then later you say what follows not only stretches the boundaries of logic it also sends out a dangerous and incendiary message. <laughs> Stop quote. And the message of course is that uh, the end justifies the means that once you decide mm-hmm. that violence is justified yes. you can just carry out violence for yes. you know any damn thing and this leads <laughs> me to the question of you know when it comes to art and literature mm. you know it it's it's perfectly obvious that you cannot 
judge a book on the basis of what you feel about a particular character books literature films have unpleasant characters who do unpleasant stupid things and that's a whole thing you're put, placing a mirror on the human condition yeah. and it is like that so you can't uh, judge a film because of what a character or a book does and yet in this case i agree with you completely mm. uh, or in the case of uh, what was that film arjun reddy we showed that uh, deeply misogynist uh, guy yes, yes, which yes. was made into some hindi yes, film also yes, yes, yeah correct, correct. and in those films these the way these people are, are just portrayed as heroes yes. that this is how you should behave mm. and so in that sense this is not art art or literature literature if one is to be pompous about this and we discussed pomposity earlier and robert mccrum would probably not approve <laughs> of uh, this so the question there is that when do you draw the line where do you draw the line and say that it's okay for nabokov to write a book about a character who's yes. into young girls mm. even though in real life he would of course uh, not approve of it yes. because it's a character in literature and you you know shining a light on the human condition but you mm. know somewhere else it becomes yes. a problem because people are going to take mm. this as a model and you're kind of mm. glorifying uh, this kind of behavior it's interesting you bring that up because obviously i don't think i would write that today so i might even be disagreeing slightly with my past self but i'm interested to remember that i wrote this in the context of writing about a film and not about a book and there is that responsibility you know uh, you can be much more provo- provoking and damaging in a mass medium than you can in something like a novel so it's built into the art form you know that uh, you cannot um, it's very rare that novels can change and damage a culture in the same way that a badly made film can i mean you walk around india today and in lots of small towns sometimes they give lectures and stuff and lots of kids uh, come along in the end i feel like asking them a question like before we leave a multiple choice question your personal style your manner and your your swagger uh, who, who does it lead to is it ranveer singh uh, salman khan virat kohli or name your choice a b c d you know uh, there are certain models of masculinity that uh, films can project and uh, and they even sometimes the bad faith is that they pretend as if they're criticizing it saying that if we by showing it we want to draw attention to uh, it's all done in very bad faith you can see and uh, um freedom of expression still means that they have to come out in the culture there's no way of proscribing them but at least one must push back in writing about them saying this is a real power to push back a narr- set a narrative back or to uh, disrupt a certain path of progress and you know uh, present an idea of uh, it's the glamour of cinema that at the end is 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 his biggest draw that figure on the screen is not 6 feet tall he's 30 40 feet tall and you know the camera angle is always from below there's a certain mechanics uh, of cinema that actually works to pro- make certain effects possible that's why it, it's amazing that india is so bollywood obsessed yet you'll find half the uh, time you go to a dinner party some where uh, people will say oh man so sharukh ko dekha tha he's so short in real life i could never believe i just couldn't recognize him the same face but the height is 3 inches low <laughs> so 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 that is the thing about cinema and uh, also you know indian uh, indian mass culture is dominated by bollywood as perhaps it should be or, or, or by cinema we are a cinema caters to everybody and uh, there are many wonderful things about that shared experience of uh, sitting in a big screen with other indians watching this but I agree those artworks the mass forms have greater responsibility and it's too easy for them to get away with this pand- pandering to a certain set ideal which also comes in the way of like p- political and religious prejudices you know it's so easy to just turn them back and say well this is how pe- society is i also find the same problem with advertising and it's too easy for all these things to say we just represent what things are i'm sorry this is not a good enough answer Fair enough. I mean, uh, but the, the, the exact <laughs> argument that you're using, by the way, yes, uh, is the reason censorship exists in India. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, because so let's keep using the argument without letting censorship come in. Yeah, can we yeah. leave it there as a midway point? Perhaps is what I'm saying. Correct, and uh, you know, use it as a you know, if if films in India are treated as an instruction manual for yes. life, then let's have a good instruction manual. Yeah. Is what you are saying. But an artist would say that, hey, wait a minute. You are sit. You are an ivory tower novelist where yes. you are not. You know, you you have whatever characters you want in your books. But uh, but yeah, I totally get what you're saying. They are free to make the films they want. We are yes. free to criticize. Let's it, say if they said that, then that's where the conversation stops. You have to either they or you have to find some new point at which to engage again, or you just leave each other be and continue on. No your, need to disagree. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot. Yeah, and and by this whole masculine role model thing, I remember I did an episode <laughs> with Shreya Bhattacharya in January. Yes. Uh, where she made the very interesting point. The episode is called "The Loneliness of the Indian Woman," yes. and the interesting point she made was that 
while the role model for most men in terms of how to behave is Salman Khan yes the person women would want mm. them to behave like a yes. Shahrukh Khan a very deep and insightful point i think using popular culture to critique popular culture is a certain art of its own and uh, this uh, is a very good book and just that one sentence is so striking immediately it clarifies something isn't it yeah. the gap between the expectations but if you're this side of gender or the other side mm very interesting i'd agree wouldn't you Yeah yeah I <laughs> so it, it you are right in the sense that if you want to capture the essence of a larger point that she makes through the book mm. that this captures it yeah. that and and this is such a deep disconnect in our culture that what men want to be is so different from what women want men to be mm-hmm. and although I know at least two women who are very passionate Salman Khan fans and can't think of him as god hmm <laughs> but would they want the men in their lives to behave like that is another question they are single you're right <laughs> 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 yeah. well, okay. They haven't found someone as good as Salman to. So as we as we, <laughs> as we get close to winding up because yes. uh, you know uh, we should soon break for lunch as well. Uh, you've got this passage in your book where you talk about how you change through your thirties, where you write, yes. "Quote so long resistant to being drawn out, as reticent and impassive as a closed book, made nervous and even jealous by people more at ease with life than I. Mm. I now took pleasure and even pride in reaching out to people. I tried to leave people in no doubt that I love them." both by concrete action and exertion and sometimes by discreet in action such as by never judging them on their reading <laughs> difficult spiritually ennobling work when someone's favorite novel is the alchemist of fountain head or one night at the call center <laughs> stop quote uh <laughs> Tell me a bit about how you've changed because you know what's happened is we were friends back then we used to hang a lot hmm. I think in essence I see you as the same cheerful optimistic hmm. person uh, who who's passionate about books but you obviously must have changed a lot in these years so so tell me Yes I I I I even think perhaps one of the reasons why for 4 or 5 years we sort of drifted away into our own spaces was we needed that to grow into our own selves and uh, there's such a thing as you know a friendship which is too intense and uh, we can re- rejoin our conversation in life uh, re- catching up again on the different points on the road and at some level i kind of felt you know my world was too narrow and i relied so much on my close friends that i never met any new ones and uh, it was a problem and uh, i needed to break out of it and what i was most frustrated by was that i could only make friends in my own class i mean we both i even struggled to make friend deep friendships with people who are much richer than me to put it you know so it was a problem on both sides and i think in this way i was cured of this problem by the restaurant because after seeing me come in day after day i was slip about this restaurant prava devi i uh, wrote what book about this uh, the restaurant and uh, when the waiters began to see me as their friend was the day i realized i've somehow without even consciously wanting to have broken a barrier in my life and from then on i've had very little trouble ever dealing of course there's still that hierarchy but i've i find i've very little trouble dealing with uh people uh in these asymmetrical power positions in india and somewhere i began to realize that uh, in the end your desire to write novels is actually a sublimation of your desire perhaps if one i mean struti kapila was in your, uh, uh, on your program the the uh, the last time around uh, and she is a very deep student of psychoanalysis and there's a lot of that in her book as well uh, is that desire to write novels basically a sublimation of a desire to un- unite with everybody in your country you want to know what the world feels like from everybody's point of view what a cup of tea feels like to a cab driver what a, a chocolate mousse uh, or a bottle of bollinger feels like to veer sangvi and to the industrialist or uh, kid drinking for the first time all these tastes all these ideas all these histories um, all, all these interactions uh, all the love affairs you want to know what they write in letters you almost like an omnivorous you know like that is your desire obviously you're not going to get anywhere close to it but Uh, boil down to something that you can actionable in your life it kind of means you know there's no time to waste and uh, you can't even sit in one place of course you can sit in one place to write but the rest of the day you know you've got to call people get around bring them over you go over travel meet uh, go to places you've never seen and somewhere i suddenly like having gotten on <laughs> for good of a uh, bad onto this thought i'm still unable to let go of it and uh, i like, feel excited every single day by this you know this thing that we've been given a great inheritance not in the ex- in the formulaic way in which you think about it i just find going out into india very exciting and for all the flaws of indian people and there's so many 
we are still a very attractive people and the more you travel around the world also you come back to thinking there's some things about india you know the hospitality uh the willingness to sit and talk uh, uh the ability to give time to people i just feel if could clear out two or three like things about the indian mindset you know the problem in talking across gender some things about class and caste we are on our way to you know like a really a like may a million flowers bloom moment for instance i see in indian love and i see young people holding hands mm. i kind of feel uh, tremendously uh, pleased to see this transformation i think when when you and i were 18 to hold hands on indian street was an incendiary gesture everybody would look at you now in many indian cities they don't on the delhi metro you know they just treat as normal that's a transformation to 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 cherish and to you know it's not come a moment too soon thousands of years have perhaps passed before it happened and all these things i feel you know uh, i know we are in a time of like uh, repression hate uh, otherization somewhere below it i feel at a smaller level another few hundred million indians we are only in a minority because we are such a big country but we are moving towards a greater integration and um, mm, uh towards a realization of the ideals of the founding fa- fathers and mothers of the indian republic on a scale much deeper than they themselves with their limited lives could imagine you know and that is what progress means and that is what democracy means and in that way i think it's very exciting um you know sometimes in lectures i say uh, um what is common between even our grandparents and you and i and uh, we are now middle aged people uh, young people look at us as old perhaps and call us uncle but even you and i share with them this common frame we are uh, citizens of the first century of indian democracy 1947 2047 all the things we'll do now if the world survives and um, democracy survives uh, will have consequent ripple effects for hundreds of years to come the little changes that we made in the light of our ideas of our time and that's an exciting space to be in isn't it it gives you some agencies a desire to live a desire to meet to talk to find out things and in that way i feel very grateful both for space the gift of the right space and the right time i think to be born in india in the year 1980 1973 74 we saw socialism we saw capitalism we saw whatever we world we are living in now globalism internationalism linked up to one another there are wonderful frame to go up and down those lines it's like virar to church gate <laughs> or the harbor line the central line all together just keep traveling using your memories adding new things to them it's enough and in that way i kind of feel you know mm, I, i think if this is our closing thought uh i would like to ask you a question in in return i want sure, it to be a sure. surprise question and i want you to uh, uh, like not think about it too much just give me a spot answer and if it, if later you think it was the wrong answer and the, it was the opposite we can always uh, go back to it in, in, uh, later um as i understand it one of the deepest differences between you and me uh in terms of personal outlook is that you are quite fiercely and consciously and deliberately and deeply and uh, an atheist and you don't want the human frame to involve god and you think it's a complication and uh, that uh, that leads us into other directions it is also damaging religions of the history and i uh, uh, on the other hand kind of uh, older i grow feel more and more like you know like my uh, my hindu faith or my inheritance or the history of hindu philosophy and in general the idea of religion is very important to me and i would say on in su- G- press to the point i would say i am basically religious and i cannot uh, for all that i want to understand the problems of religion i cannot uh, disinherit myself from my religious inheritance but if you can leave that difference aside and uh, won't you say that uh, given your life and mine and where we have lived and the city we were something to hmm, uh, how do i put it in the end uh, your religion and mine is bombay the way we understood the city the what we saw in it the things we know through it the persons we become through it that it has no code or whatever but you know it when you see it and that is that is our faith okay i'll i'll <laughs> i'll give a two part answer now it's a lovely question and uh, i'll no doubt think more about this even after this recording but yes. as you want an off the cuff answer i can think of a two part answer which yes. the second part is two parts so now the first part is this that I'm not a militant atheist in the sense that at one point in time I would have argued that if someone believes in religion they are by definition irrational and cannot be trusted because obviously there's no proof for god existing and all of that. 
Today, I don't think that is a case in the sense I that. I agree with you. Yes. It, today, I don't think that is a case because, uh, sure, I mean, and I'll uh, link to an article I wrote about, an essay I wrote about this, where you know, which makes a distinction that atheism is not a belief; it is an absence of belief. Yes. Just as not collecting stamps is an absence of a hobby; it's not a hobby. Uh, you know, no one says my hobby is not collecting stamps. But my sense is that I understand that human beings are frail. That, as you pointed out earlier, that reason cannot solve all our problems. Human beings are frail, and, and the truth is that we're going to die, and life is meaningless. So, how do you get? How do how do you get by? Yeah. Right. And the point is, we all do choose our own delusions. Somebody else's delusion may be religion, but I have no doubt have a delusion which I choose. Perhaps it is a delusion that. my uh, uh you know mortality is something i don't need to deal with right now and it'll come later but the very fact that i can sit here and have this conversation and all of that uh you, we all need crutches in a sense to get by so i understand that i am not even condescending and saying that this is an inferior crutch we are humans we are frail i get why religion is there i also get that many belief systems today which would not be called religions which are maybe ideologies have qualities that are religion like and uh, so in that sense uh, i'm not you know uh, militant in that sense now as far as being a religious person is concerned my sense is and this goes to what you were saying just before this also is that you are perhaps focusing on the positive aspects of religion and of course there are positive aspects of religion like the sense of community the you know uh, different aspects of different festivals which bring us together and so on and so forth and i get all of that and we need that in our lives we can't be atomized in in fact that's a critique some people often make of individualism that oh we can't be atomized human beings but the whole point is my argument always is that not you know atomization is a straw man the point is we should all be individuals and yes. uh, 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 free to engage with others voluntary interaction is a key thing there so i have no issue with anybody being religious per se but i have a massive problem with organized religion any organized religion i mean and I, and i think that so many of the ills that are in our nation today like earlier you spoke about one or two minor things they're not minor things especially in the context of today you know things like class caste gender uh, and especially the anti muslim sentiment that is you know is tearing this country apart it's not a minor thing it's it's a big deal it's always been there in our society similarly i think the aspects that you like about our society the fact that we almost without thinking about it assimilate so much we are like this delightful kitchri of influences from everywhere and so on and so forth you know and i think that is also something that predates the indian republic you know both of these predate the indian republic but the point is that right now it's hard for me to be as optimistic as you because i i yeah. see these negative things and feel so strongly about them I, I, and i think that organized religion also has that problem that i i just see uh, so many issues uh, with it that i don't really want to elaborate upon but where do all these issues come from the the the, the misogyny the sexism yeah. uh, caste you know all these come from organized religion yes. you know so but that's why i was slightly shifting the platform to something more sudden and more about religion being bombay yes our, our private religion something that you know like the has this thought ever come to you that everything in life you owe to a certain city or what you learned here or uh, that there's some ways of being here that you feel that you know are fundamental to who you are uh, and that your life is a continuation on uh, on down that river i think that's a deep thought uh, i think bombay can mean different things to different people so if i sort of think of bombay as meaning a certain ethic of life that you go your way i go mine we don't bother each other and we 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 trade freely we live freely all of that i can buy that but bombay is a lot more than that i don't know if it's so much as bombay but uh, i think it's a little more cosmopolitan and globalized like that unfortunately i can't help it my biggest influences are all sort of western influences in a sense yeah. from the enlightenment and the thinkers i admire whether it's uh, adam smith who as you so rightly point out in your book is a lot more than just uh, the invisible hand or uh, uh, you know hayek and so on so i'm a mix of everything of course there is a core that is indian and there'll be a core that is bombay but I don't know if it was you who introduced me to Konstantin Kavafi but he's got this great poem called The City. Yes. And that speaks to the sentiment which I have actually read out on this podcast before. So can I ask you to read it out? Sure. The City by Konstantin Kavafi. You said 
I'll go to another country, go to another shore, find another city better than this one. Whatever I try to do is fated to turn out wrong and my heart lies buried like something dead. How long can I let my mind molder in this place? Wherever I turn, wherever I look, I see the black ruins of my life. Here, where I've spent so many years, wasted them, destroyed them totally. You won't find a new country, won't find another shore. The city will always pursue you. You will walk the same streets, grow old in the same neighborhoods, turn gray in the same houses. You'll always end up in this city. Don't hope for things elsewhere. There's no ship for you. There's no road. Now that you've wasted your life here, in the small corner, you've destroyed it everywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a fantastic uh, uh, poem. I think I read it out in my episode with um, uh, Sarah Rai. Mm. And uh, yeah, and in my episode with Amitabha, you would have remembered I asked him, what is this Gangoli? In the sense, what is his notion of home? Yes. And I think you've indicated that your notion of home to a significant extent is Bombay. Yes. Between literature and Bombay, I think these are the two overriding... Uh, and they're so... Uh, you know, there could be also literature in Bombay, Bombay in literature, etc., etc. You can keep on mixing them. But I think these are the two main currents flowing through my life. And they keep on mixing in new... Yeah. And in fact, your book is called My Country is Literature. So you could also say my city is Bombay. <laughs> yeah. Look, yes. I'll, uh, uh, a, a couple of last questions before we kind okay. of end. And mm -hmm. it's actually two questions, but they, I think they lead to the same place. One is what advice would you give to the young Chandrahas, maybe the Chandrahas in Cambridge in 2002, who just come across that ad for writing a review? What advice would you give him? Which feeds into uh, a, a different way of phrasing, I think, the same question. What advice would you give to the young reader and writer today who is listening to this and thinking of a life in literature? Hmm. Well, uh, as for myself, you know, I think uh, it's always, uh, it's strangely, it's somewhat arrogant to try to preach to your former self because only by learning what, like, uh, by, through, by finding out, uh, blundering through what you did not know do you arrive to who you are today. You cannot return to your past and cut your own roots out. You can obviously criticize some bits of ourselves, as I've done in the introduction of my book, saying I was almost too bookish and I treated literature like a crutch rather than a place of release and a place of freedom as a place, as a way of engaging with the world. So I don't think I would, like, strangely enough, I'm quite content with my past. You know, I don't think I'll change anything about my life. Even the bad things that happened. I'm quite, you know, I kind of feel I've made my peace with everything. And um, even those who have left or disappeared, I kind of feel I can mentally carry on a conversation. So I have no advice to give other than, you know, um, perhaps let go a little bit. I think I was too intense and uh, didn't know how to enjoy myself. And uh, it was part of the tension I grew up with living in a very insecure home. And I, again, I have some empathy for that. You know, it took me a long years. And when I, maybe that's why I'm making up for lost time. Every day is a sort of party these days in my life, much of the time, <laughs> including today. Uh, and uh, for young people, you know, uh, it's a different time to be a young writer today than it was 20 years ago. Things have changed a lot. So precisely for that reason, when I hear a young person today saying I want to become a writer, I have more respect for them. It's so much more easy to want to become something else that if after all that you say books are what means the most to you, it shows that you're serious. It's much, much easier to learn to become a writer today than it was 20 years ago. So it, uh, that bit is good. And uh, I think um, young people also don't have the hangups, especially in English, about writing in English that people our generation are just a touch above us, did about writing a certain way, trying to please certain people. Every young Indian writer now writes their own English with complete confidence and it's very nice to see. I like reading Indian books, even mediocre ones for this reason. It's their own English. It's not a pretend English. And uh, other than that, you know, we live in a fantastic, a country is a library and your library also is a limitless library. You know, that what you see in a bookshop is only a fraction of hang around in, you know, go to Flora Fountain, Blossom's Bookshop, uh, old bookshops everywhere, put together a library of the great books from the last 60, 70 years. And it will give you an India over and above the India that you see in front of you. When you join together these Indias of land and library, you'll suddenly have such a powerful point of view on your own life that you will both live more interestingly and write better. And the last bit's the technical side now, you know, once you have a command over language, uh, no need to be in a great hurry over it. In the end, literature is about communicating, not about necessarily being right. And uh, you will get that 
10 15 years down the line enjoy the ride till then and remember to take uh, pleasure in every day and do a bit of work even if not at your desk every day every day you must go forward in some way even if by reading and making some notes you don't have to write every day it's not required go forward a little bit by little bit just like with so many other things you know in the end you won't realize how far you've come by not noticing where you're going and also something I think uh, that both of us uh, have experienced working with young people. <laughs> that boss, the years pass very fast. <laughs> yeah, the yes, years yes. pass very freaking do, fast. They do, they do. Don't waste it on petty things. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, I couldn't say that, uh, the second that more. You know, when you're 25, it looks like life goes on forever. At 42, you realize you already feel you're running out of time for all the things you want to do, all the people you want to see, all the things you could not say to people. So uh, that way, literature is a life intensifying device. Let's put it that way. So within that, it has a certain code, which is that you don't waste time. And that's such a lovely way to put it like <laughs> intensifying device and on that note see I end all my episodes asking my guests yes. to recommend books films music that they love yes. and especially in your case that absolutely has to be the last demand I make of you <laughs> like what are your desert island uh, books mm. or films or music or what, what, what you just want yes. the whole world to read yeah I, in one quick stretch I'll write, uh, uh, I can read off the main influences of my life musically uh, from the age of 18 till the age of 42 I've had only one Predominant influence, although I've had many others below it. Uh, I like film soundtracks because I find the absence of words helps me compose in the mornings. And I like listening to music. But from the time of 18, I've always been a fan of the Pakistani rock band Junoon. And it has never changed. And I keep listening to the same songs on loop year after year and finding new meanings in them. I even find as a way of interpreting the subcontinent and that Sufi philosophy. And the, even the uh, I, I'm even willing to defend the point that Salman Ahmed is one of the greatest rock guitarists in history. Just like some Indian novelists are not regarded disregarded so so was he but every solo in there has some meaning for me and I really love this private archive you know 25 year engagement with the repertoire uh, uh, and uh, cinema wise uh, of um, it's very variegated I like uh, in general I like artworks which are optimistic cheerful and full of the uh, chaos and comedy of life I have a definite bias towards comedy and uh, and uh, uh, a sense that life basically is a tragedy that you must live as a comedy in order to make it bearable. I think that is my root philosophy. You know, the, you never know when the next terribly painful or traumatic thing will happen, but you kind of have to bolster yourself and make the day cheerful. And, you know, verbal repartee is so, so, so energizing, so much fun. I like comedies like that as well, you know, where just talk between people. So in books, I think uh, the, uh, the main representative of the spirit in Indian literature is a almost unread writer these days, uh, Verrier Elwin. Uh, I think his books and his studies of tribal India are enormously fascinating as somebody who only lived to be 62. He came to India in his 20s, came to be a priest, ended up becoming a, more tribal than even the tribals and lived in small settlements going from one place to three, every two, three years. Uh, the Tribal Life of Verrier Elwin, his autobiography, to me is such an enormously amazing book about being cheerful under a continuous stress, misery, pressure, and material deprivation, which you've voluntarily taken up. Uh, and finding beauty in the smallest things and in, in trees, flowers, in human faces. Uh, so uh, to me, it's a great, great Indian book by somebody who's not Indian. And in uh, writing my favorite novelist or fiction writer of almost anywhere uh, and someone I admire deeply personally and in an imaginary dinner party this will be the, almost the first guest on my list along with a few others you know one makes a mix of live and uh, people from the past but uh, Adam Smith would definitely be one again for someone who like you know has that uh, the cheerful spirit while realizing that life is very difficult, uh, that mix of uh, toughness and uh, good cheer is, is very appealing. But in the end, I think Bhivuti Bhushan uh, Bandipadhyaya is a combination of wisdom, naivet, wonder in, uh, the, the beauty of nature, love of the different voices of society, that adda kind of feeling of sitting down to gossip with everybody, uh, putting yourself in the mind of many kinds of characters, including children, notoriously hard to do for novelists who are adult. You know, they make all sorts of things, but can't really get to it. Vibhuti Bhushan's children are really children uh, and his adults are really adults. And uh, his outlook on life is very, very poetic. And that mix of a love of the created world of culture, i.e. the city, and behind that, the long-term world of nature, the forest. Few Indian novelists balance 
a love of both these worlds in such an equal and exquisite proportion is Vibhuti Bhushan. And you can't tell, if you read a single book by Vibhuti Bhushan, you can't tell. Sometimes he looks like he's a city person. And in some, some other stories, he looks like a village, a, a real initiate of rural life. And to me, this is a complete perspective. You know, all kinds of points of view on life you can find in his books. And to me, that again, that idea of you know, trying to merge with all of India from the point of view of of the other party is to me most perfectly expressed in uh, not as an explicit philosophy but in between the spaces of, of the stories in his work so in the end you know like uh, a page or two of Vibhuti Bhushan a day should be part of the Indian constitution after <laughs> 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 yeah. maybe we won't have so many boundaries against each other Chalo, there's another way of looking come on sit let's have a cheroot or a cigarette or a cup of tea we'll work it out Fantastic water. And uh, you, you know, you spoke about liking comedies more. And I remember this old quote, I forget who it's by, where uh, the the quote goes, the world is a tragedy to those who feel a comedy to those who think. <laughs> so I guess you have identified yourself as a thinker there. Mm. Uh, j- just in passing, who else would you invite to the dinner party? Bibhuti Bhushan is your chief guest sitting at the head of the table. There's Adam Smith. Who else? Yes. Among women, I always loved Irene Nemirovsky. You know, not just such a well-known writer even today, but I find her extremely fascinating. Killed at the age of 39 in the Holocaust, but again, the writer of some ferociously ruthless books, which are amazing in the intensity of observation. Great training to be a writer. The, my favorite first sentence in the entire history of novels is uh, from Sweet Frances. Uh, it's only four words long. Uh, you know, you open a novel, you think it's going to be some introduction to life. It just says, hot thought the Parisians. Somewhere in Paris. That's all you need to establish your point of view, the setting, the locale, everything. And a a a, a, a Communal consciousness of a phenomenon. There's not an individual that's being represented. Hot, comma, thought the Parisians and you're on your way. The cart of the train has set off on his journey. Uh, so uh, I found myself so intrigued by some mysteries about her that I'd love to see, uh, see her, especially, you know, and we must invite people like that who left life too early. And uh, I think, you know, you cannot live be an Indian today, especially and even in our time without um, having uh, both Gandhi and Nehru come over even to debate among themselves like they had in the time. That way, even in Elwin's book, there's an amazing passage at the end where he talks about the differences in philosophy in the thought of Gandhi, Nehru and Tagore, where each one of them did something that the other didn't. And merely that that trident of explication is so amazing. You think just the fact that these three lived in dialogue with each other was a much bigger thing than anything that they themselves did. And um, uh, so um, we've covered literature, we've covered uh, poetry, politics, um, somebody from food uh, or, you know, some person from one's past will be different from you and for me. And uh, perhaps someone one, also someone one hates or really dislikes in the hope that such an evening will be the day when that now, especially, I think I would not have answered this question like this till about a few years ago. But now as a result of having grown older and also as a result of how we're living in India today, this would be an important, the 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 the, the shadowed, the shadow, the other would be a part of whoever it is in your life. Which hated person would you call? <laughs> wouldn't, I wouldn't say I actually hate somebody, but somebody whom you felt you saw doing something that you couldn't forgive or that you felt that, you know, the, the arrogance, the brutality is such that you can't feel that it would ever say something to them uh, and treat them like a human being. Even there, sometimes, um, perhaps there could be some space where even they could change and you could change or you could change together the way you cannot by yourself. Some mysterious person, let's leave that out as a, <laughs> or some traumatic figure from your life. You know, God knows there's enough, enough and more of those people who said something to you, cut you off, destroyed something about, maybe they couldn't help it or, you know, who knows the full story. That's the whole, the, the whole logic of the novel. You never know the full story. Maybe you could call Hitler and serve only non-veg <laughs> because he was a vegetarian, right? Was he? I didn't know that's what he seemed yeah, like yeah. a very non-veg sort of person. People contain multitudes. Yeah, yeah. So Hitler was a vegetarian. This so call him a... serve only non-veg or call Ambedkar and seat him next to Gandhi mm. and place him such that every time Gandhi wants something, he has to ask Ambedkar to pass it to him. <laughs> yes, alcohol would be served. If you're a alcohol non-drinker, no, you, I'm sorry to say that the host decides the rules of the party. Have a drink for once, Gandhiji. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was wild enough without it but yeah dude Chandrahas thank you so much for uh, this great conversation no, I hope no, if like you actually up. have a dinner party you'll call me yes uh, yes we must do it we haven't done one for a long time we must uh, and uh, yeah thanks so much this was great 
No, no, my pleasure. So uh, thank you. I mean, The Seen and the Unseen is a great title. And I must say in concluding, I don't know like if uh, anyone has talked about this wonderful cup that you have uh, for your... You're holding an old piece of merchandise. Yeah. Okay, it was a merchandise. It's a great, great idea. The flag of India, but actually it's cut up as a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, as a metaphor for thinking about how to be an Indian, I think I've never seen an image, frankly, as, uh, as, as provoking and as deep as this. So uh, really lovely. I'd love a cup like this to put right in front of my desk in... Uh, well, so I'll send you one the next time we make uh, any more <laughs> yes. of these. This was a cover image of an old episode I did with Ram Guha. So I'll link that from the show notes if people want okay. to see the precise image. It was an hash. absolute pleasure. Now, please clear away the furniture. I've, uh, I've stored one ball from those days. We've got to have a test match. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> if you produce a ball, I'll call your bluff. <laughs> okay, chill Thanks another so much. time. Yes. Bye. If you enjoyed listening to this episode and who doesn't enjoy listening to Chandrahas, head on over to the show notes, buy all his books, follow him on social media. He doesn't actually seem to be on Twitter anymore, but you can follow me on Twitter at Amit Verma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen at seenunseen.in. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you. <laughs>